Yep, it's exactly what you think it is. I guess this kind of video was inevitable, especially after I sat down and watched a six hour video going through and ranking every episode of The Simpsons. That video done by Ellis Mark will be linked down in the description if you have some time and want to check it out after you're done here. Now, I'm sure that everyone here already knows what The Office is. It's by far the most popular video topic on my channel and is usually the most requested topic for videos when I ask people what they want to hear about. So I'll spare you the whole let's go through what The Office is part of the script and get more into talking about how exactly I'll be handling this video. I'll be going through each and every episode and giving my thoughts on them and then ranking them from best to worst by season. At the end of the video, I'll have one of my top and bottom five episodes. And obviously, this is all my opinion. I'm not looking at IMDb scores or anything like that. I'm also not going to be giving each episode an individual score because I don't really like the idea of scores like that. And I'm also not very good at them. I fully expect that I'd get to the point where I'd be giving a video one of three scores, a one, a five, or a ten. And that really doesn't get across what I want to say about each episode, and could honestly take away from my final thoughts on each episode. I also won't be going into an incredible amount of detail for each episode, but there will be ones where I talk more about the plot than others. It'll be kind of dependent on the episode and what all is actually going on. There's going to be episodes where I just don't have a ton to say. And really quickly before we get into this, I've set the personal goal to try to get to 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year. So I would be eternally grateful for everyone if they could go down and click subscribe if you aren't already. Thanks again, let's get into it. This is the episode that started it all, but honestly, it's a pretty weak opening. There's just not a ton to say about this episode. It's basically just a retelling of the pilot of the British version and serves to introduce us to many of the characters we'll come to know and love throughout the show's run. Characters like everyone's favorite, Devin. Or these people. Where would we be without these people? It's not a bad start to the show, but it's just a bit uninspired, using the majority of the jokes and gags from the British pilot. There's also not a ton happening here story-wise, as the point of this episode is just to give you an idea of who the characters are and what their dynamics are in the beginning. Michael buying himself a world's best boss mug is very indicative of what he thinks of himself and what everyone else thinks of him. Also, slicked back, receding hairline Michael is absolutely cursed. A relatively weak start to a show, especially considering what we know it'll turn into. This is the first original script in the series and is honestly leagues above the previous episode. This is the first point where the show feels like what it'll eventually become. The episode revolves around diversity training after Michael's continued use of a pretty popular Chris Rock bit. Michael ends up taking over the meeting and things go awry from there. This episode introduces us to a lot of the side characters who aren't fully fleshed out quite yet, like Kelly. We also get the first real hints at something between Jim and Pam when she falls asleep on a shoulder in what's become a pretty iconic shot for the show. This is a solid episode and gives us a pretty great Michael Scott line. Abraham Lincoln once said that if you're a racist, I will attack you with the North. And those are the principles that I carry with me in the workplace. Healthcare is the first episode that really lets Dwight take center stage in the show, and obviously, that's a really good thing. Michael ends up tasking Dwight with picking a new healthcare plan that will end up cutting most of their benefits. Dwight, of course, picks the worst, but cheapest plan, and everyone is upset. Michael tries to hide from everyone, but is eventually confronted by the entire office, and everyone just kind of stands there. it's super awkward and kind of hard to watch, in a good way. There's some really good funny parts in this episode, like the ending, or when Dwight has everyone reveal their personal illnesses and ailments in front of everyone. Overall, a good episode, but not the strongest of the season so far. The series' fourth episode revolves around the continued idea of downsizing, with Dwight and Jim forming an alliance that Jim takes advantage of in his first major prank on Dwight in the series aside from a bit of jello. Jim and Pam end up teaming up to pull various pranks on Dwight throughout the day, and this culminates in Jim grabbing Pam's hand to explain part of the prank to her, when Roy, her fiance, enters the scene and things get a little scary. This is the first major time that Roy and Jim kind of face off like this, and it's honestly kind of intimidating. This is an alright episode, not really one of my favorites, but still pretty good. 
To me, basketball is the first episode that really feels like it fits in with what The Office will eventually become. It almost feels out of place in the first season for that reason. There are a lot of absolutely hilarious parts in this episode. Stanley's dribbling and Michael's reaction to it, Dwight's attire, I love his anime shirt, and Michael's flop. But what makes this episode really stick out to me is the tension between Jim and Roy throughout the entire game that ends with Roy elbowing Jim in the nose. This episode has everything that makes the later seasons great and feels like the first time the show found its voice and executed what it wanted to in a successful fashion. And I really feel like I need to reiterate, Dwight's anime shirt is hilarious and fantastic. You could make a religion out of this. This episode is pretty forgettable. Michael decides to let Katie, played by Amy Adams, sell purses in the conference room. Dwight and Michael both try to hit on her, but at the end of the episode she leaves with Jim and Pam looks a little jealous. This episode is pretty weak, especially coming off of four episodes that felt like they were beginning to understand the formula of how to make an episode of The Office really work. I think it's just there to show that the whole Jim and Pam thing isn't just Jim. It goes both ways. That's what she said. That's my joke, damn it, Dwight. Overall, this is a relatively weak season. I know the show gets better, but I understand why a lot of people traditionally rank this season pretty low. It's a great introduction to many of the characters, even if the writing staff isn't quite sure what to do with all of them yet. A lot of the characters are still raw and unrefined, but you can, for the most part, get a good understanding of what each character wants, what makes them tick, and who exactly they are. This season really begins to find itself after a pretty not great pilot. Basketball really sticks out to me as the best episode in the season, but if I looked longer at the list, I'd probably shuffle some of the other episodes around a bit. Let's get into season two and some better episodes. This is the best possible way to start off after a relatively weak first season. Michael decides to hold his annual employee award show at the local Chili's. There's a lot of great things in this episode. Michael rapping over another song's lyrics, Dwight on the keyboard sound effects, and Phyllis getting the bushiest beaver award instead of the busiest. Roy eventually leaves Pam at the Chili's after they get into a fight, and Pam has a couple drinks too many. This is the first time we see this side of Pam, and it's pretty hilarious. She ends up winning a Dundee, giving a great speech. And I feel God in this Chili's tonight. <laughs> and kissing Jim before he puts her in Angela's car to be driven home. Which is honestly the weirdest part of the episode, considering what we see from Angela in the future. But good for them. This is a fantastic episode, it's by far the best episode we've seen at this point in the series. The next episode isn't bad, The Dundies is just a hard episode to follow. So in this episode, the branch has to go through sexual harassment training because the CFO of the company resigns after allegations from his secretary. Michael doesn't take it seriously the entire episode, but by the end he recognizes that jokes that are being made are upsetting Phyllis and he steps in. I like this episode. It's cool to see progress from Michael for the first time in the series. These kinds of episodes are usually my favorite to see, especially after the first season where Michael has little to no redeeming qualities. We're also introduced to Todd Packer, Michael's best friend, and much, much more importantly, we're introduced to Michael's catchphrase. That's what she said. <laughs> Michael. Michael. <laughs> Michael, please. 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 The Office Olympics is just an all around fun episode. While there aren't a ton of quotes from this episode, this is definitely one that's greater than the sum of its parts. The episode has two plots happening at the same time. One plot follows Michael and Dwight as Michael prepares to close on his condominium that we'll see later in the series. This gives both Dwight and Michael plenty of time to shine and bounce their comedic chops off each other. The real estate agent thinking that Dwight and Michael were a couple and it going completely over their heads was also hilarious. But while Michael and Dwight are out, Jim and Pam put together what they call the Office Olympics, with all the games being ones that the workers in the office play in order to avoid doing actual work. It's a solid effort and a pretty iconic episode. Yet another classic, The Office episode The Fire revolves around a fire in The Office. I have trouble hearing the song We Didn't Start the Fire without thinking of this episode. While it's a pretty simple plot, even as far as The Office goes, there's a ton of funny parts in this episode. Michael pushing everyone out of the way after the first fire alarm goes off, 
Dwight in the car listening to R.E.M., and Dwight going into the fire to find Michael's phone, and Michael then realizing that he actually had the phone on him. We ultimately find out that the fire was started by Ryan, which serves to knock him down a few pegs he was managing to climb up. Another great episode. This season's off to a much better start. Well, maybe I spoke too soon. This episode to me feels much more like a season 1 episode than a season 2 episode. This is probably because it returns Michael back to the villain role that he was in for the majority of season 1. Part of what makes season 2 work so much better than the first is that the blame was removed from Michael and put more on corporate. It makes Michael much more likable. But this episode reverses that for a bit. Because Michael needs to fire someone. And that someone is Creed. Or at least it was almost Creed. But Creed convinces Michael to actually fire Devin. You remember Devin from earlier in the series? Good old Devin. There's a subplot where Jim and Pam try to get Dwight another job, but it's not the best plot in the series. Not my favorite episode. In this episode, Michael's procrastinating signing some documents, and somehow the entire office ends up at Dwight's dojo during lunch so that Michael and Dwight can fight. Michael wins after what I guess can technically be called a fight, and a small rift appears between them before Michael promotes Dwight from assistant to the regional manager to assistant regional manager. Kind of. There's also a small subplot with Jim and Pam that continues to hint at mutual feelings between the two. This season really dials in on the whole will they, won't they thing. And for the most part, it's pretty well done. Again, a really great episode that gives us yet another classic Michael line. Would I rather be feared or loved? Um, easy, both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. The Client is kind of a weird episode, but weird in a really good way. The A-plot in this episode revolves Michael and Jan trying to make a sale together at Chili's. While Michael appears to be, well, Michael throughout the meeting, we eventually see his genius shine through. Patrick, your genius is showing. Where? Michael, through his joking and laid-back nature, is able to disarm and make the sale, impressing Jan and us. And then Michael and Jan share a kiss for the first time. This added depth to his character is greatly appreciated. The B-plot introduces us to Threat Level Midnight for the first time and is also pretty enjoyable. Another all-around solid episode. Performance review feels kind of like Whiplash after the previous episode. After seeing Michael act more like Michael Skarn, he's back to his more ignorant demeanor. The bulk of the episode revolves around Michael getting everyone's thoughts on the potential relationship between him and Jan, before Jan ultimately shuts this down for the time being. Jim and Pam also convince Dwight that it's actually Friday on a Thursday and he's late to work the next day. There's not a lot to say about this episode. It's not terrible, but it's not my favorite. I really like this episode. Michael finds out that he now has access to all of his employees' work emails. And, of course, he immediately begins invading any semblance of privacy there may have been. While snooping through everyone's emails, Michael finds out that he wasn't invited to a party that Jim is throwing, something that upsets him. After failing to get Jim to admit to throwing a party without Michael telling Jim that he read his emails, Michael, in true Michael fashion, ends up crashing the party to pretty hilarious results. Michael's improv class scenes were also hilarious. The Office always did Christmas episodes well. They're usually regarded as some of the best episodes throughout the series, and it would make sense that the first of these is an amazing episode. Seeing Michael throw a tantrum because he went way over the agreed upon price and getting upset when all he got in return was a homemade oven mitt from Phyllis is really funny. It's an all around solid episode that lets some of the characters we haven't seen too much of yet get a bit more spotlight. Booze Cruise does something that a bunch of episodes so far were afraid to do. Push the Jim and Pam will they won't they relationship forward just a little bit. After Michael takes the entirety of the office on a booze cruise in the middle of January in Pennsylvania, which is a terrible idea by the way, Roy drunkenly announces that he and Pam have set a wedding date. Jim, distraught, breaks up with his then girlfriend and confesses to Michael that he has feelings for Pam. This is a pretty good episode. I like that they put Dwight on the fake wheel and told him that it steers the boat and he 100% believes it. This episode never fails to make me laugh. There's so much in this episode that perfectly exemplifies what makes the show hilarious. 
Michael burning his foot on a George Foreman grill because he wants to wake up with cooked bacon. Dwight's car crash. Dwight being normal while suffering from a concussion. And finally, Michael sticking his foot into the scan being done on Dwight. It's fantastic from start to end. This is the first major callback in the series. In a previous episode, Jim had told Michael about his feelings for Pam, but the thing is, Michael is Michael. Michael ends up taking Jim to Hooters for a hilariously awkward lunch. Michael ends up revealing the secret and Jim has to admit to everyone that, yes, he does have a crush on Pam. Or at least he did, several years ago, which makes him a liar. And Pam finds out later that he only told Michael this on the booze cruise. Another good episode, not the best in the season, but better than most. So someone pooped on Michael's carpet and now Michael has to work from Jim's desk because, well, there's poop on his carpet. Michael eventually becomes convinced what happened to him was a hate crime, but eventually his entire perspective on this changes when it's revealed that it was actually Todd Packer. Suddenly it's hilarious to Michael and all is forgiven. I don't have anything against this episode, but it never really stuck out to me as exceptional. Very mid-tier episode. Jan comes to town to hold a Women in the Workplace seminar. So Michael, of course, decides to hold a competing Men in the Workplace seminar. Seeing Michael try to fit in with the warehouse guys is always fun to watch. Michael, after crashing a forklift, accidentally inspires the warehouse crew to start a union, something that corporate was desperately trying to avoid with Jan even threatening to shut down the Scranton branch if they do. Ultimately, as the day ends, we see Michael leaving through the warehouse that has been mostly destroyed with Daryl swearing revenge. We also see more cracks in the relationship between Pam and Roy. I really like this episode. There's a lot to enjoy in it, and I think it's pretty funny from start to finish. I also like seeing more of Daryl. This is honestly a super slow episode, and it's probably, in my opinion, one of the weaker episodes of the season. It serves more to set things up later in the series rather than to pay things off itself. In this episode, we see a bit more of a relationship between Michael and Jan, as well as some basic relationship things in the Scranton branch as well. This also marks the first time we see David Wallace though, so at least there's that. A pretty weak episode in an otherwise strong season. This is another relatively forgettable episode. Again, there's some solid parts of the episode, and the high point of the episode is, of course, Dwight's actual speech, which has points taken from both Lennon and Mussolini's speeches. Blood alone moves the wheels of history! There's some pretty good jokes in this episode, but it just kind of suffers from not being memorable. This episode is one that I think usually flies under the radar. It's a pretty underappreciated episode, aside from one line. Boy, have you lost your mind, cause I'll help you find it. And to be fair, that is an amazing line. Seeing Stanley break his usual character like this is hilarious and terrifying at the same time. This episode really works because of all the previous episodes that really build up all the characters and let us get to know them for this to work. It's a very good episode, but probably not the best of the season. I think I might just really like Stanley, or at least angry Stanley. Boy, have you this episode is one of my least favorites, not just from the season, but in the series. In this episode, Michael is more concerned with his birthday than the fact that Kevin might actually have skin cancer. For someone who eventually views his employees as his family, this feels kind of uncharacteristic. Yes, Michael has been shown to be selfish, but this feels a bit too much for his character. This episode does set something up between Michael and his real estate agent, but aside from that, I think this episode could effectively be skipped and nothing would realistically be lost. Aside from Dwight's sweet birthday gift to Michael, that is. Another pretty mid-tier episode in my opinion. As with any episode, there's a couple quality jokes, but overall it's forgettable. The episode revolves around Dwight finding half a joint in the Dunder Mifflin parking lot. This leads to Dwight interrogating the bulk of the office. It's funny, but nothing amazing. Jim even gets jinxed and doesn't talk for most of the episode. It's definitely a pretty weird episode and, in my opinion, pretty weak. It's not bad, those episodes don't come until later, it's just not great. This is another episode that I don't really like too much. At this point in the series, you've kind of started to see The Office as more of a family. And this episode tries to make everyone kind of hate each other. 
I mean, the episode is literally based around disagreements and arguments between basically every coworker. There's also a point in the episode where all of Jim's past pranks are read off back to back to back to back. There's a lot of them. And watching Jim react and slowly come to the realization that he's kind of a dick is uncomfortable. The Office usually does the whole uncomfortable but finding the funny in there really well. But there isn't a lot of humorous undertones in this episode. I don't really like this one. The season finale is definitely a highlight in the series. It brings a bunch of different plot lines from the season all into contact with each other in a really solid manner. Michael's potential relationships with both Jan and his real estate agent, the whole Jim and Pam will they won't they relationship comes to a head for the first major time and Jim potentially leaving Scranton because of Pam. This episode has a lot to juggle, but it does so exceptionally well. And moreover, it balances the comedy in with all these converging plot lines in a way that we really haven't seen from The Office yet. And seeing Jim kind of pour his heart out and still getting rejected is always hard to watch. This is a great way to end the season and a really good setup for the next. Season 2 is a definitive step up from Season 1, and I think the writers and everyone involved with the show knew that it needed to be. That's probably why the season is so front-loaded with great episodes that kind of trail off as the season progresses. They knew that they really needed to come out of the gate strong in order to build their audience and to show the network that they deserve more seasons and more episodes. And they did that well. This is a great season of a great show. There's a couple points where you can tell that the writers were still sort of figuring some things out, but aside from that, this is when the show really starts to find itself. I also didn't have a ton to say about a lot of episodes because some of them just sort of speak for themselves in terms of quality or lack thereof. Anyways, on to season three and some new characters. While the previous episode was great because it was able to rely on all of the plot lines and threads that were set up throughout the season, this episode is kind of the opposite. Because of all the status quo changes that occurred off screen, this episode takes a considerable amount of time just kind of catching people up. Jim's left the Scranton branch and it needs to introduce us to a whole new cast of characters including Andy and Karen. Pam and Roy ended up calling off their engagement, but Jim doesn't know. And, of course, Oscar is being forced to come out about his sexuality. This episode, for a good portion of it at least, has to kind of forsake comedy for the sake of slight info dumps to let people know where the season might be heading and to set up threads that will pay off later. Because of this, the episode isn't quite as strong as many of the episodes that have come before. But that doesn't mean it isn't without its strong points, like Michael forcibly kissing Oscar as a show of reconciliation. It's an episode with some very strong parts, but overall, it's very mid-tier. That's assault, brother. The convention is a return to form after the previous episode. This episode really takes advantage of the new status quo. The episode follows Michael and Dwight as they head to an office supply convention with everyone else from Dunder Mifflin, including Jim, who is now working in the Stanford branch. This episode has a ton of hilarious parts. From Michael's jealousy of Jim's new boss, to Michael's party, to possibly one of the greatest lines in the entirety of the series. I love inside jokes. Love to be a part of one someday. This episode also ends on a pretty nice high note with Jim actually going to Michael's party and a few other people finally showing up. It's kind of nice seeing things go Michael's way for at least a little bit. Also, the part where Jim walks into Dwight's room, sees Angela, and assumes she's a prostitute is hilarious. I like this episode. It really takes advantage of where all the characters are at this point in the series and executes on its plot really well. This episode is weird. Or at least I always thought it was weird. Dwight is convinced by Angela to go behind Michael's back to talk to Jan about why he should be the Scranton branch manager instead of Michael. To me, this always felt kind of out of character for Dwight. How quickly he turns on Michael after he thinks that he got the position feels like something that he wouldn't do. Dwight's wanted to be Michael's best friend for the entirety of the series up to this point, and to all of a sudden have him be a dick towards him feels rushed and out of left field. But aside from that aspect, this episode has some very funny parts and jokes. The Crentice the Dentist line is, of course, legendary and Jan walking in on the office watching Varsity Blues always makes me laugh as well. 
I think this is a very good episode, but it's kept out of the very top spots by some uncharacteristic actions by Dwight. This episode isn't my favorite. In fact, I'd say it's one of the weaker episodes that I've seen so far. Michael's former manager dies after driving drunk, and he makes the whole office kind of cope and deal with it. Jim does one of his over-the-top gestures for Karen, but aside from that, this episode is just kind of a downer. Not fantastic, but almost saved by the great Creed line at the very end of the episode. Initiation is one of those episodes that works on basically every level. The A, B, and C plots all work very well. Dwight takes Ryan under his wing to his first sales call, but instead of going to the call, Dwight takes him to Shroot Farm and hazes him, even trying to get him to wrestle with his cousin, Mose. Ryan stands up to Dwight, who gives him some actual advice and they go to the sale, which Ryan ultimately doesn't make. Meanwhile, Pam is tasked with keeping track of everything Michael does during a normal workday. Seeing Stanley and Michael come together for the first and maybe only time in the series over pretzels of all things is hilarious. Again, I think I might just love Stanley's character. But despite doing basically nothing all day, Michael does end up securing a huge sale. And finally, Jim's story, while mostly forgettable, does end with him and Pam talking on the phone for a bit and showing that there is definitely still a very real connection between the two of them. Great episode. While Initiation is a very hard episode to follow, Diwali is more than up to the task. The episode revolves around everyone in the office going to a Diwali celebration. Michael, of course, thinks it's like Halloween, so he invites Carol, his real estate agent, who dresses like a cheerleader. Michael actually ends up proposing to Carol while at the celebration, and she turns him down. Turns out, this is only their ninth date, which makes this a super Michael Scott thing to do. Seeing Ryan fail to make a good impression with Kelly's parents is also pretty hilarious. But my favorite thing in this episode is seeing a drunk Jim singing with Andy. It's surprisingly wholesome and nice to see Jim actually just having a good time. Another absolute banger of an episode. This episode is another weird one for me, but I think that this one works in a way that other weird episodes didn't. The news has come out that the Scranton branch will be closing. Some of the employees will be moving to Stamford, and the rest will be laid off, as the branches begin to merge together. It's kind of bittersweet seeing how all of the Scranton employees take the news and how much they'll clearly miss each other. Aside from Stanley and Creed, the latter actually selling a bunch of Scranton equipment to make a quick buck. But it eventually comes out that the Stanford branch manager, Josh, leveraged this position into a position with Staples, and that the Scranton branch will actually now absorb the Stanford branch instead meaning that many of the characters we've come to know in Stanford with Jim will now be introduced into the Scranton ecosystem. While the episode isn't the funniest we've seen in the season, it's just nice seeing how the Scranton workers do actually care for each other. This is another pretty solid episode. This is the point where all of the new characters are introduced to the old. I really like this episode because while the episode itself is very funny, it sets up a ton of new character dynamics and relationships that we haven't seen at this point in the series. For instance, when Karen had the absolute gall to not know who Bob Vance Vance Refrigeration was. You have a lot to learn about this town, sweetie. This episode does something that I've complained about a few times throughout this video. It mainly just sets up future plot points, but unlike many other episodes that have done this, this episode doesn't try to skimp on the actual jokes and humor. And speaking of which, the Scranton City rap is phenomenal. Because we've already seen some of the characters from the Stanford branch, it's an easier transition into this new normal. Also, I don't really like early series Andy, I did a whole video on that. Prison Mike is arguably one of the greatest things to come out of The Office. Now, this is a pretty easy thing to miss. But, if you look closely when Michael turns his back to the camera, you can see him actually put a bandana on his head. That's right, you heard it here first. Prison Mike and Michael Scott are actually the same person. The episode, which mainly revolves around the Scranton branch, finding out that a Stanford employee who recently began working there after the merger had spent some time in prison, is hilarious from start to finish. This episode also has a pretty unique interaction between Michael and Toby that isn't entirely hostile. And of course, Andy singing Rainbow Connection in full falsetto to Pam is one of my favorite things. I love the Muppets. I said earlier in this video that The Office's Christmas episodes are some of the best episodes in the series. This one is no exception. 
Technically, this is two episodes also, but it's usually viewed as one experience. While most episodes are funny throughout, this episode has too many solid jokes and scenes to keep count of. There's Michael's photoshopped Christmas card with Carol and her family. The terrible people who won't let Dwight sit with his friends. Like, seriously, what's their problem? These are 100% the worst people in the series. And the feud between the party planning committee and the very distinct committee to plan parties. Angela's pettiness is on full display when she pulls the missing power cable for the karaoke machine out of the plan outside her party. This episode is the first one that has all of the characters together, knows exactly what to do with everyone, and executes on it amazingly. Fantastic episode. In the previous episode, Michael had invited an unknown person to Jamaica over the phone. In this episode, Michael is, as the title suggests, back from said vacation. And while showing some pictures from his vacation to the office, eagle-eyed Pam notices that there's someone who looks an awful lot like Jan, Michael's boss, in the background of one of his pictures. Something that Michael vehemently denies and then almost immediately confirms to the documentary crew. And to make matters worse, while chatting with his good friend, Todd Packer, Michael accidentally sends a pretty spicy pic to packaging by mistake. The picture makes its way around the entirety of Dunder Mifflin. There's also a pretty heartwarming scene of Dwight comforting Pam after he finds her crying after helping Jim with his relationship with Karen. This is another good episode, but nowhere near as good as the previous episode. And while Kevin leaving with the picture of Jan and Michael is pretty hilarious, this isn't the best episode. This is the first half of a two-parter, but I'll be treating these episodes as separately because that's how they were originally aired. I'm not the biggest fan of this episode, but mostly because I don't like mean Andy. It's easy to forget, but he's a huge suck-up slash corporate ladder climber type early in his run on the show. And this episode takes full advantage of that, for better or for worse. It's for worse! There's a couple funny parts in this episode, like Michael throwing Phyllis' car keys and Dwight rocking out to Motley Crue. But overall, I don't have a ton to say about this episode, aside from the ending, where Dwight ends up quitting after being caught going to New York. Michael assumes that Dwight was going behind his back to Jan again, when in reality he was helping Angela, who he's been secretly dating. Seeing Dwight and Jim work really well together, and then Dwight hugging Jim as he walks out of Dunder Mifflin is surprisingly sad. But aside from that, this is a very middling episode. I like this episode more than the previous because this is the end of Mean Andy. The episode features the return of Oscar Martinez after he was given a paid vacation following the events of Gay Witch Hunt. The office decides to throw him a Mexican-themed party because of course they do. Andy, meanwhile, is annoying the entirety of the office and Jim has had enough. He hides Andy's phone in the ceiling and keeps calling it. That, paired with Michael's rejection of Andy, leads to him having a kind of breakdown where he punches a hole through a wall. Angela eventually gets Michael to convince Dwight to come back, which he does successfully, and towards the end of the episode, Jim admits to Karen that he still has feelings for Pam, continuing to push the will-they-won't-they they plotline. This episode has a lot of funny parts, with Dwight declining the blindfold for the piñata being a definite high point. But I think what makes it really strong is the way that it builds on what we know about the characters and reveals some new sides of them that were previously unseen. Like Andy's anger issues, or Angela's softer side. This is a good episode. This is definitely a weaker episode in the season. I think the tension in this episode makes it mostly unenjoyable. The confrontation between Karen and Pam is one of those things that usually makes me want to skip past portions of an episode. It's not funny, there's no comedic relief, it's just pure, unadulterated confrontation. There's funny parts in other parts of the episode, but even the jokes aren't as strong. Yes, it's funny seeing Dwight be convinced that the Ben Franklin impersonator that was hired instead of a stripper for the women is actually Ben Franklin, but that's about all I can really think of from this episode. This episode really puts Michael's obnoxious personality on display. He's really trying to find a way to make Phyllis's wedding about him. And the only reason he's in the wedding is so that Phyllis can get extra time off for her honeymoon. The episode has some funny points. Dwight hunts down wedding crashers and he ends up keeping Michael out, and Michael throwing a fit after Phyllis's uncle gets out of his wheelchair and walks down the aisle. But ultimately, this episode really falls into the more cringe category for me than the funny category. 
Yes, there are funny parts, but I think it's a middle of the road kind of episode. Wow, you can really tell when the season gets out of its groove. This is another pretty underwhelming episode. Michael goes to Ryan's business class to talk about what it's like to run a business. But unbeknownst to Michael, Ryan was actually talking about how obsolete Dunder Mifflin's business plan actually is. This obviously upsets Michael who goes on a whole tangent about how Ryan never made a sale and doesn't really understand business. This episode does have one of my favorite pranks where Jim pretends to be a vampire after there's a bat in the office. I'm not sure why I like this prank so much, but I'm surprised people don't talk about it more. And of course there's Pam's art show that, aside from Oscar who dismisses Pam's art, only Michael shows up to. It's a really nice scene seeing how much Michael truly does care and support everyone in the office. But aside from that, it's definitely a mid-tier episode that could have been greater. This episode usually makes me feel very uncomfortable. And I'm sure that's by design, but this doesn't have the usual comedic undertones that many other episodes have. Both settings for the plots have very painfully awkward beginnings, middles, and ends. Michael and Jan, while officially beginning the relationship here, are as dysfunctional as ever. Dwight critiquing the home's construction and foundation is pretty funny, and Roy finally finding out about the kiss between Jim and Pam and destroying the bar and freaking out on Pam is hard to watch. The funny parts of this episode don't really outweigh the hard to watch parts in my opinion. Roy has been fired after attacking Jim, and Dwight has been hailed a hero. I always laugh watching Angela go around and asking everyone to give their accounts of what happened between Dwight and Roy. But honestly, the episode is just kind of sad. At least in terms of the character of Michael Scott. We find out in this episode just how underpaid Michael actually is. But at least in the end, Michael does get a raise. Andy also returns from anger management this episode as well at the very end. Guess who's back? <laughs> Not the biggest fan of this episode. After the last five or six episodes, this feels like a grandiose return to form. This episode is hilarious from start to end and gives us some iconic lines and scenes. Dwight, you ignorant slut! After entering Daryl, Michael, and subsequently the rest of the office, must sit through safety training for the warehouse and the warehouse, conversely, must sit through the office's safety training. Though after Daryl and Lonnie make fun of the training, Michael decides to demonstrate just how dangerous working an office building can be by jumping off of the office building and landing safely on a bounce castle. He's going to kill himself pretending to kill himself. Daryl talks Michael literally off the ledge with a speech that, to almost anyone else, would be viewed almost exclusively as an insult. Also, Andy wants to be called Drew as symbolism for leaving his past self behind, but Jim says no. Dick move. This episode is a classic and one of those episodes that most people would point to when they think of what the peak of the show actually is. This is a Creed heavy episode, which doesn't happen often and should be beloved as such. And of course, this episode is a fantastic one. This episode starts with arguably one of the most remembered and beloved cold openings, where Jim shows up dressed as Dwight. But then after some risque paper is sent out because Creed doesn't do his job of quality insurance, Dunder Mifflin faces pretty significant blowback and they have to go into damage control mode. Which for Creed is lying through his teeth, getting a woman who did nothing wrong fired, passing around a card for her that people put money into, and then pocketing said money. And for Michael, this means holding a press conference. Here is your headline. Scrin Area Paper Company, Dunder Mifflin, apologizes to valued client. Some companies still know how business is done. There's also a pretty funny subplot that revolves around Jim and Andy going to apologize to a high school and realizing that Andy's girlfriend is in high school, which is the biggest of yikes. But in all honesty, this episode is funny the entire time, leaving little to no room in between jokes. Great episode. This episode has a lot of really good parts. Phyllis gets flashed in the Dunder Mifflin parking lot. Pam is given the task of sketching the perpetrator from Phyllis's memory. Though she just ends up drawing Dwight with a mustache and no glasses with the words, this man is a pervert underneath. 
Dwight, of course, hangs these up, not realizing that it's actually him. Michael ends up taking the women of the office out to the mall, where he eventually begins talking about his relationship with Jan and decides he needs to break up with her. He leaves her a voicemail, and then she almost immediately walks into the office, apologizing to him for the way she's been treating him. Then she realizes she's got a voicemail, and we get to see her realize in real time that she's been broken up with. This episode has some funny concepts, like the Dwight sketch, but ultimately I think that this episode isn't up to par with that specific bit. It's a very mid-tier episode. Beach Games is another episode that really benefits from us having gotten to know the characters and their dynamics through the last several seasons. This episode is about Michael secretly using a company beach outing to pick his replacement as he thinks he's going to be getting a promotion. But a lot of what we know about characters kind of gets flipped in some interesting ways. We know that Stanley is not typically super driven to do his job, which is what makes this funny. Angela supporting Dwight in secret by sabotaging Andy and leaving him floating in the lake is also hilarious. But the biggest moment in this episode is when Pam walks across Flaming Coals and finally confronts not just Jim, but really the entire office for how she's been treated throughout the season. This is a big moment for Pam, who for the most part has been pretty passive. This marks a huge change in her character that we see bits of throughout the rest of the series. I really like this episode. This is another two-part episode and also the season finale. As with the previous finale, it pulls together all of the plot threads that have been planted throughout the season in a very satisfying way. The episode revolves around Michael, Jim, and Karen all interviewing for a position at corporate that is later revealed to be Jan's job. The episode doesn't have a ton of time for jokes as it's trying to neatly wrap up as many plots as it can. Michael and Jan end up getting back together for no particular reason. Dwight is named manager when Michael thinks he's a shoo-in for the position, so we get to see what the office would look like under Dwight. There's a lot of Stanley Nichols and Shroop Box, though the conversion rate between the two is still hotly contested. Michael ends up resigning after learning that not only is he not getting the position, but that it was Jan's old job. And finally, we see that even though Jim was doing well in the interview and most likely would have gotten the position, he finds a note from Pam as well as a medal from the office Olympics. This leads to him going back to Scranton in one of the most iconic and beloved scenes in the show. Totally Pam, sorry. Um, are you free for dinner tonight? Yes. All right. Then it's a date. I'm sorry, what was the question? Season 3 is usually regarded as one of, if not the, very best seasons of The Office. This season has many of the most iconic scenes and jokes of the whole series. The episodes this season are far more hits than misses and it really feels like they nailed down what makes the show work. The writers do a fantastic job the entire season of finding balances between the characters, their relationships, and their motivations in a way that previous seasons hadn't quite figured out yet. This whole season, even its bad episodes are worth watching and typically have at least some redeeming qualities and jokes that make them worthwhile. Overall, this is one of the best seasons of comedy that has ever been aired. A huge step up from previous seasons, let's move on to season 4. This season starts off with a bang. <laughs> fun Run is another one of those fun two-parter episodes. In fact, this season has quite a few of them. This episode also does a much better job of catching everyone up on what's happened off camera than previous premieres had done. Karen is gone. Ryan is now the boss, Jim and Pam are dating but keeping it secret. So after Michael hits Meredith with her car, the doctors find out that she also has rabies from the time that a bat got into the office. Michael decides to put together a 5k run. You have reached the offices of Dunder Mifflin Scranton. Currently the entire staff is out doing the Michael Scott DMSM PMC Rabies Awareness Pro-Am Fun Run Race. For the cure. Pam also walks in on Michael changing in his office, which she tried to defend by saying that A. Pam didn't follow proper knocking procedure, and B. European offices are naked all the time. Obviously. Dwight and Angela also get into a fight after he kills her cat. This is the point in the series where I think Andy becomes a very likable and funny character. 
Seeing him drafting behind Kevin, who's running in a full suit and tie, is absolutely hilarious. Great episode. Yet another two-parter. This episode is mainly about Ryan coming back to Scranton for what is possibly the first time since accepting his new position as everyone's boss. Ryan tries to flex his new power as much as he can and begins to introduce his pet project, Dunder Mifflin Infinity. Creed and Michael both see this as a way to fire the elderly workers, and while Michael takes the direct approach, Creed goes his own way with it. Hey, bra, I've been meaning to ask you, can we get some Red Bull for these things? Sometimes the guy's gotta ride the bull, am I right? Later, skater. This episode has a couple other great scenes, like Michael driving his car into a lake because of his GPS, and Kelly trying to manipulate Ryan into restarting their relationship. This is a good episode that would be nearly top tier in almost any other season of the show, but it has some tough competition this time around. This episode directly follows what had been set up in the previous. This is the launch of Dunder Mifflin's brand new website and Ryan's personal project, Dunder Mifflin Infinity. The episode starts with Jim and Michael driving to New York City to attend the launch party before Jim realizes that what Ryan gave him was a link to join a virtual party. Pam and Jim also prank Dwight this episode, convincing him that Dunder Mifflin Infinity has gained sentience, and challenges him to a sales off that he ultimately wins. There's also a point where Michael kidnaps a pizza delivery boy and refuses to let him go until he realizes that, yep, that's a felony. Andy makes a huge deal trying to get Angela to go out with him, and while she doesn't agree to this, she does leave with a smile on her face. Honestly, I always felt like this episode was on the weaker side. There's nothing exceptionally funny, at least when compared to previous episodes. Very meh, in my opinion. Another two-parter, but this one is one of the first real delves into the relationship between Michael and Jan. We see Michael and Jan talking about renovating Michael's condo that they're both currently living in, and we also hear that Michael and Jan also traded in both their vehicles for a much more expensive one. Michael is, very plainly, dealing with a huge amount of debt, and Jan is actively adding on to that. This all leads up to Michael eventually declaring bankruptcy. Michael ends up running away and tries to begin a life on the rails as a hobo, but Jan does end up finding Michael and talking some sense into him, which is honestly a difficult task most of the time. The B-plot revolves around Jim and Pam finding out that Dwight has turned Shroot Farms into a bed and breakfast, or as Dwight calls it, an agro-tourist attraction. They spend a night there, and not only do we get a glimpse into the weirdness of Dwight and Moe's, but also into how hard Dwight has been taking the breakup between him and Angela. This episode is amazing and hilarious throughout both parts. Dwight's quick mention of the storm never fails to make me laugh. This is definitely one of the best episodes so far. This is the first episode that isn't actually a two-parter. This episode is interesting because we really see everyone come together and work towards something in a way that we really haven't seen yet which is weird considering they're literally a business. Michael begins to rally the office around creating their own commercial, rejecting the template from corporate. It's nice to see the ideas and skills that other people have outside of their usual jobs, such as Daryl's musical skills, something that we've seen in a previous episode, but this takes it to a different level with songwriting. Not to mention all of the singers he brings on. There's also Pam working through the night to get an animation that she's working on finished in time for the commercial. This episode isn't the funniest in the series, but it has kind of a heartwarming, relaxing quality that most of the episodes don't have. It's a very good episode in a very different way. Branch Wars is a return to the more traditional comedic nature of the series, at least compared to the previous episode, which was much more wholesome. This episode revolves around Michael and Dwight tricking Jim into going to Utica to get back at Karen Filippelli, who has been named Utica's branch manager. Michael and Dwight believe that Karen is trying to lure Stanley away from Scranton, and Jim goes along as well to make sure they don't literally burn Utica to the ground with Dwight's homemade Molotov cocktails. I love this episode. There's a lot going on. Between hearing Dwight describe how he wants to mace the security guard's eyes. I can see the security guard's eyes. No, no, don't do anything to them. I have to do something to his eyes. Stanley thinking that Michael is some kind of genius for calling his bluff about leaving Utica. And the awkward confrontation between Jim and Karen, which, unlike in some previous episodes, doesn't overstay its welcome. This is probably my favorite episode of the season so far. 
After Toby returns from a camping trip with Ryan that Michael wasn't invited to, Michael decides to go out into the woods himself, a la Survivor Man. Dwight decides not to leave him alone and watches him from a distance, ultimately saving his life. In the B plot, Jim is getting a taste of what it would actually be like to be manager, trying to combine all of the birthdays in one month into a mega party. Michael eventually confides in Jim that he did the same thing back when he started managing. This and the following conversation kind of freaks Jim out, thinking not that just he and Michael are similar, but that Jim could end up working in Dunder Mifflin forever, maybe in Michael's position. It's definitely interesting seeing a more vulnerable side of Jim and seeing the resurfacing fear of staying at Dunder Mifflin long term. Something we've seen alluded to in previous episodes. This is a good display of all the character traits we've seen built up to through the last few seasons. Another good episode. The deposition puts the relationship between Michael and Jan front and center for the first time. The episode revolves around a lawsuit between Jan, who is alleging that she was fired because of her breast implants, and Dunder Mifflin, her former employer. We see how she's coached Michael on what exactly to say and that she's convinced him to side with her against Dunder Mifflin. However, after Jan submits Michael's private diary into evidence and we also find out that Michael was not a serious contender for Jan's position, Michael ends up siding with his employer instead of his girlfriend. You expect to get screwed by your company, but you never expect to get screwed by your girlfriend. The B-plot revolves around Jim and Daryl playing ping pong and Jim eventually being trained by Dwight. It's pretty underwhelming. The episode has a lot of funny parts, like everyone in the deposition thinking that the Ryan that Michael was talking about is a woman, and not his current boss. But while the A-plot is pretty hilarious, the episode is dragged down by a mediocre B-plot. That lands it pretty close to middle of the pack. This is it. The episode that most lists will have at number one in terms of best episodes in the series. And of course, they're right. This episode stands out even among other amazing episodes in what may be the best season of the show. It takes a special episode to do that. This episode revolves around Michael managing to successfully trick Jim and Pam into coming over to his and Jan's condo for a dinner party, with Andy and Angela also being invited and Dwight eventually showing up with a date of his own as well. From the time they show up at the party until the party is cut short by a huge fight between Michael and Jan, the episode is hilarious. It's cringy in the best possible way and highlights the dysfunctions between Michael and Jan. Dysfunctions that have only grown since the previous episode where Michael sided against her in the deposition. You have no idea the physical toll the three vasectomies have on a person. There's so many memorable lines and scenes from this episode that it's almost impossible to pick a favorite. Obviously, this is a fantastic episode. This episode has a pretty dark ending, especially when compared to many of the previous episodes. After breaking up with Jan during the events of Dinner Party, a newly single Michael falls in love with a chair model in an office catalog. Dwight does some research and finds out that the model actually died a while back. Michael and Dwight go to the woman's grave, grieve for a bit, and eventually end up singing and dancing on her grave, which is kind of morbid. There's another plot where Kevin and Andy work together to get their parking spaces back, which is successful and leads to one of the most emotionally raw moments from Kevin, an unexpected source. After Stacy left, things did not go well for a while. And, and it was hard to see. It's just nice to win one. I like this episode, but it's not the strongest. Maybe I'm being extra critical because this is after dinner party, I'm not sure. But I love seeing emotional moments from characters you don't expect. Not great, not terrible. Michael and Dwight decide to go to New York City for a night out with Ryan who, when they show up, is on drugs. They hang out with Ryan for the night. It's fun to see Dwight and Michael in a very different setting than we're used to. Also having Dwight be incredibly successful with the ladies is always hilarious. He even manages to get everyone into a club by pairing them with women from a basketball team. This plot is pretty funny. On the other end of things, the rest of the office has decided to stay late to get work on Ryan's pet project, Dunder Mifflin Infinity 2.0, finished, so they won't have to come in on the weekend. They end up staying too late and being locked in the office. Eventually they call the security guard whose name no one but Creed can remember, and have to wait for him to come to let them out. Then. It happens. Focus. Focus. 
Toby does the reasonable thing, says he's leaving the country, jumps over the wall keeping everyone trapped, and runs away. I really like this episode. Seeing everyone in settings that we don't typically see them in works really well here. While it's not the funniest episode in the series, it's still a good watch. Now, this may come as a surprise, but I love Stanley's character. And this episode opens with Stanley snapping at Michael in one of my favorite scenes in the show. This episode does a lot to build upon the Michael and Stanley dynamic. That mainly ends with Stanley just telling Michael that he doesn't respect him, and Michael telling Stanley that's fine, but he can't talk to him the way he did in the office, and the two shake hands. And while this episode could be construed as making Michael look more pathetic, I think it does a good job of showing that Michael is actually a good boss sometimes. He cares about his employees, but doesn't demand their respect constantly, just an air of professionalism. Or at least a vague, tiny amount of professionalism. Which is weird to think about coming from Michael. In 1B plot, Ryan kind of goes after Jim, most likely because of jealousy, and gives him an official warning for his job performance. In another plot, Dwight manages to get Annie to sell him his car for cheap and then places it for sale on eBay at a marked up price. I like that there's a lot going on in this episode that's very character informed. Everything works with what we know of all the characters and it comes together in a very funny manner. In this episode, we see something we really haven't seen, Jim actually trying at his job. After Ryan goes after him in the previous episode, Jim decides to not give him any more ammunition by landing a huge client which he does by being persistent. Meanwhile, Michael, Daryl, Oscar, and Pam all go to a job fair at a high school, which gives us one of my favorite lines. I would never say this to her face, but she is a wonderful person and a gifted artist. Why, why wouldn't you say that to her face? They manage to get no one cool enough for Michael, and the whole thing is mainly a failure. But while there, Pam is inspired to possibly give graphic design school another shot. It's definitely a weaker episode that isn't fully saved by a couple of good lines or funny scenes. As with most of the previous season finales, this episode brings together all of the plot lines scattered throughout the season. Toby is leaving for Costa Rica after putting his hand on Pam's leg. Michael, ecstatic that his worst enemy is leaving, decides to put a bunch of money down and have the party planning committee throw their largest party yet. But what is kind of unexpected is Michael immediately falling head over heels for Toby's replacement, Holly. Also, Dwight tells Holly that Kevin is mentally challenged. That won't pay off for a bit. There is great chemistry between Michael and Holly, and it's funny to me that at the end of the day, Michael has Toby to thank for this. Michael then finds out that Jan is pregnant, but says that he is not the father. Jim is also planning on proposing to Pam at the fireworks show that he paid a few hundred dollars to help fund, but Andy instead loudly proposes to Angela, who says yes. And finally, we see Ryan getting arrested after inflating the numbers on Dunder Mifflin Infinity. There's a lot going on in this episode, and I think it works well for the most part. Michael's parody song, Pam actually admitting that she found Toby cute, and Phyllis catching Angela and Dwight doing the horizontal monster mash. A great way to end the season. Season 4 is typically considered the high point for the series, and that's not wrong. The whole season is great from start to finish. But to be fair, that could be because of the season's length. The season was cut short due to the writer's strike. This honestly could be a big reason why there's so many hour-long episodes this season. I'm not entirely sure. A longer season might have gifted us with more episodes on par with Goodbye Toby or Dinner Party. Or it could have given us the worst episodes of the series. It's hard to tell which would have happened, but the writers were definitely hitting their stride at this point, so I think that it likely would have been the latter. But yes, this season is absolutely fantastic. It's one of the greatest seasons of TV that's likely ever been created. Let's find out if season 5 can follow this up successfully. Much like season 3's first episode, this one is mainly there just to catch us up on what happened between seasons. While there are a solid amount of funny moments like Holly finally being told that Kevin is not intellectually disabled, Michael buying a pair of Counting Crows tickets off of Holly and then tearing them up in front of her, and Dwight abandoning Phyllis miles from the office and making her walk back in order to lose weight. This episode has a lot going for it, but I think it ultimately falls just a bit flat. Though we do finally get to see Jim propose to Pam outside of the gas station halfway between Pam's school in New York and Scranton. There's not a ton to say about this episode, it's very meh. 
This is another kind of weak episode. While Holly and Michael are holding an ethics meeting after Ryan's whole fraud thing in the last season, Michael gives everyone a chance to say anything unethical they may have done without the threat of getting into trouble or facing consequences. Meredith eventually reveals that she's been doing the do to get company discounts as well as Outback Steakhouse coupons. Holly, being the HR rep, is obviously upset about this. Her and Michael eventually get into a bit of a fight with Holly not viewing the office as a family as Michael does. But the two eventually make up. I don't really like this episode. It's not the funniest and seeing Michael and Holly fight always hurts my soul. Huh, this season's off to a really slow start. This is another episode I'm not a huge fan of. It revolves around Michael throwing Jan a baby shower. However, once she shows up, the baby has already been born. I don't have a lot to say about this episode. I never really liked it too much. The cold open is pretty funny and we get to see Michael finally ask Holly out, but that's really about it. My least favorite episode for a while. Well, I guess here's this one. As much as I didn't like the previous episode, at least that one had some memorable moments. I honestly couldn't remember much from this episode on my rewatch. Michael and Holly continue dating, the office is broken into and a bunch of stuff is stolen, and they hold an auction to raise money to get stuff back. Bob Vance Vance Refrigeration does bid $1,000 to hug his wife, which is pretty sweet. This episode isn't bad, but it's definitely forgettable, which is a terrible thing for an episode of TV to be. This episode is kind of bittersweet for me. While there are a lot of funny parts, seeing Michael and Holly realize that the current iteration of their relationship is coming to an end is hard to watch. But Daryl being stuck in the truck, helping Holly move while they start crying is one of my favorite gags in the entirety of the show. Seeing Daryl scramble to get someone to talk to on the phone while Michael is kind of breaking down is hilarious to me. I'm not sure why. But yes, we do ultimately see Michael and Holly break up, which does suck and is painful to watch. There's a B-plot about Dwight and Andy getting into a Cornell-related argument, which honestly I wasn't a fan of. The Michael and Holly plot definitely drags us up to a mid-tier episode, though. Jim and Dwight have both gotten some pretty negative customer feedback, and as a result, had to do some training with Michael. Louder, son! But liquor! Our prices have never been lower! But eventually they come to realize that Kelly is actually just upset with them and forged some fake customer surveys in order to get back at them. They reveal this to Michael, who really doesn't do anything about it. I don't know if that's kind of weird. Like, I get that Michael isn't really one for firing anyone, except for my boy Devin, but it's still weird to see that you can literally do anything in this office and there are no consequences. Not a huge fan of this episode. There aren't really any major redeeming qualities or jokes, aside from the butt liquor bit. Business Trip feels like a great return to form after a slow start to the season. Michael, Andy, and Oscar are sent to Winnipeg for a business trip. While this originally seems like it's going to be a Michael-centric episode, I actually really prefer the interactions between Oscar and Andy as the two get absolutely wasted at a bar. Seeing the budding friendship between the two is pretty wholesome, actually. Towards the end of the episode, while talking to David Wallace, Michael actually stands up to and kind of goes off on him for the first time during the series. Which is weird for Michael, but it's nice to see him standing up to the company for the first time. This to me is meant to show that the relationship is different than the previous one with Chan, where Michael chose to stick with Dunder Mifflin rather than siding with her. Pam also returns from New York and Daryl and Kelly break up. It's a pretty solid episode. This episode has one of the most iconic and widely remembered cold opens. No God! No God, please no, no! With Toby's official return from Costa Rica, Michael decides to resort to drastic measures to get him fired. For Michael, this means buying some illicit substances from a warehouse worker, planning it in Toby's desk, and calling the police. Or at least, that's the plan. What Michael actually buys and plants is a salad that he paid way too much money for. The episode has its funny moments, like Dwight's classic description of his perfect crime. But the microwave subplot is pretty forgettable. We see Jim buy his parents' house to surprise Pam, which is sweet, but also just a small portion of the episode. Another pretty mid-tier episode. This episode feels a lot more fun than many of the others this season. It's a lot more light-hearted. And I think a big part of that is that this episode features many of the cast members. I really like episodes that don't focus in on two or three characters. It's nice seeing everyone get a chance to shine and get a good joke in or two. 
Oscar explaining exactly what a surplus was to Michael several different ways, simpler and simpler until he finally understands it, is hilarious. As is seeing Michael buy a fur coat and immediately get fake blood thrown on it. In the B-plot, Dwight is giving Angela and Andy a tour of his farm where they're planning on having their wedding, but during this, Dwight manages to actually marry himself and Angela, which is psychotic. A good episode, probably the best of the season so far. I've said it before, The Office does Christmas episodes well. Its Christmas episodes are almost always among the best of the season, and this is, of course, no exception. The episode has three plot lines going on throughout. First is Michael forcibly trying to take Meredith to rehab for her drinking. Him literally dragging her into the facility is pretty funny, but I think they devote maybe just a bit too much time to it. In another plot, Dwight has bought every doll of what he thinks will be the most popular Christmas gift and is selling them at a markup to desperate parents. Which is evil and pretty similar to something I'm dealing with now. It's pretty funny. And finally, Phyllis is still blackmailing Angela after she caught Angela and Dwight doing the no pants dance last season. Phyllis continues to push Angela around until she finally stands up to her, and Phyllis reveals to everyone that Angela is cheating on Andy with Dwight. This isn't the funniest plotline in the episode, but it sets up a lot for the future. A great episode overall. Usually, big plot lines layered throughout the season don't get fully resolved until the season finale. This episode is a huge exception. After it was revealed to the office last episode that Angela was cheating on Andy with Dwight, the question then turned to, who tells Andy and should they? Michael, knowing that he's leaving Scranton to meet with David Wallace, decides to tell Andy as he's literally driving out of the parking lot. This leads to a confrontation between Dwight and Andy, and the two decide to duel, with Andy kind of winning it by sneaking up on Dwight in the parking lot with his Prius. It's a funny episode a lot of the time, but Michael's subplot with David Wallace isn't the greatest. Angela also comes off as absolutely terrible in this episode, and I mean, she is. She's been cheating on her fiancé and leading both men on. It's not a bad episode, but not the strongest either. This is another episode that gives a lot of characters a chance to shine, something that I've already said I love. Michael and Dwight go undercover to trick a local family-run company into giving them their customer list, which would allow Dunder Mifflin to steal their customers. Which they eventually do, and down the line, we actually see that the company has gone out of business. In the other plot line, the rest of the office gets into a lively discussion on whether or not Hilary Swank is hot. Every character gets a chance to speak their mind, which is always fun to see. You rarely get to see Salesman Stanley, and it's fantastic. I really like this episode. I think it's one of those episodes that toes the line between cringe and funny really well as the best episodes of the series have done. This is a great and fun episode overall. So I'm treating both episodes of Stress Relief as one episode. I'll talk about both parts a little bit, but keep it all under this specific umbrella. This, in my opinion, is the greatest cold open in the series. Stay calm! Wait, 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 wait. It features all of the characters and puts them in a panic that we don't usually see them in. Plus, Dwight lighting a fire to test everyone's reactions is classic Dwight. It's fantastic and sets the episode up perfectly, with Stanley having a heart attack at the end. Swan, don't swallow it! I'm fine! Leave me alone! The episode keeps it going with everyone going through CPR training. Andy singing and Kelly dancing, as well as Dwight cutting the face off the CPR dummy, are both hilarious moments. Andy also misinterpreting Pam and Jim talking about Pam's parents as genius movie takes is another great moment. Also, I really want to watch the fake movie they watch. This whole part is absolutely fantastic. And the second part keeps it going. The roast of Michael Scott goes exactly as you'd expect it to. Michael doesn't have the thick skin to deal with something like that and eventually just gets upset. But he ends up coming back into the office to roast all of his employees, which lightens the mood and makes Stanley laugh thus relieving his stress. All around, this is an absolute monster of a two-parter. It's fantastic from the beginning and keeps this energy throughout. Lecture Circuit is another two-parter, but it's borderline impossible to follow the absolute insanity that was stress relief. It might just be because this is after such a good episode, but Lecture Circuit feels relatively weak. There are a few good moments littered throughout both episodes, like the birthday sign, but overall I think that this is a much weaker episode than some of the others. 
Pam finally got closure with Karen, which is nice, and Michael gets a glimpse of hope with Holly, although she is currently dating someone else, which sucks for him at the moment. This isn't the best two-parter by any stretch of the imagination. This episode is another weird one for me. It's pretty depressing throughout most of the episode, with the central theme seemingly being missed love or something along those lines, with a few characters learning and healing enough to kind of move on. Michael meets and connects with a woman while donating blood, although he passes out and never even gets her name. He throws a lonely hearts party, and at the end, Kevin, whose fiance had left him, manages to get a woman's email address. I really like that Kevin was able to get another win. He's very precious and should be protected. On the other end, Jim and Pam are out on a double date with Phyllis and Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. Though Phyllis and Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration, sneak off to open the gates of Mordor, wink wink, in the bathroom at the restaurant. While this does have the nice Kevin ending, it isn't the funniest episode in the season, let alone the series. It's relatively weak on that end, but Kevin helps bump it up just a bit. This is one of my least favorite episodes of the season so far. After Michael's plan originally to place golden ticket coupons and random supplies of paper backfires, he convinces Dwight to take the blame. It's then revealed that the plan actually worked and was incredibly successful. Michael then tries to take the credit back. This episode isn't funny enough to make up for Michael acting this selfishly. I never really like seeing Michael take advantage of Dwight like this, and I'm happy that Dwight at least got some recognition, at least for a bit. Definitely a weaker episode. This episode introduces us to the third person to have Jan's job in three seasons, Charles Minor. The introduction of Charles gives us a lot of new character moments that we probably wouldn't have seen otherwise. This episode is one of the few times we see Jim on the defensive for a bit after he makes a bad first impression with Charles. After Charles gets under several people's skin, Michael attempts to get into contact with David Wallace, but has some difficulty doing so. After heading to New York City and under Mifflin Corporate himself, Michael actually ends up quitting, realizing how little the company actually cares for him. This episode isn't the funniest, in fact, it's kind of depressing a bit. But it's nice to see Michael finally stand up to Dunder Mifflin after years of taking their crap. That alone helps bring this episode up a few notches in my book. Michael has put in his two weeks with Dunder Mifflin and is somehow taking his job less serious than he already was. After realizing he has no options lined up for money or a job, Michael has the great idea to start his own paper company. After failing to get several people to join, Charles has Michael escorted out of the building, though Pam decides to go with him and join his company as a saleswoman. Much like the previous episode, this one isn't that funny, but rather it's there to set up the next arc in the season, and that arc starts now. Michael is putting together his dream team for his company. This includes Ryan, who's never made a sale, Pam, who's never made a sale, and Vikram, who's made all the sales and eventually quits. This episode continues to sort of set up the idea of Michael Scott Paper Company, so the plotline isn't that funny, aside from one incident where Michael tries to get money from his aunt who asks him a bunch of business questions that he really can't answer. The funnier part of the episode is Jim and the rest of the office trying to get on Charles Miner's good side. This ends in a soccer game where Charles kicks the ball at Jim, but Jim ducks and Phyllis ends up getting hit in the face. But like, honestly, Charles kicked the ball trying to do some damage to Jim, right? Like, that's way too hard for a scrimmage like this, right? Not a super strong episode, but this is still serving as setup for the Microscope Paper Company to get going. It's Brittany, bitch. This episode finally begins to feel like payoff for the last three episodes. This introduces us to our first new main character in two seasons, Aaron. Aaron is a fun introduction to the series who adds a lot of new character options. Pam and Ryan get into an argument about who should copy something because Pam doesn't want to be a receptionist again, and Ryan is, well, Ryan. Dwight and Andy both end up trying to seduce Aaron, but end up bonding while playing Country Roads. At the end of the episode, we see Pam successfully make her first sale. I like this episode. It's pretty funny and gives us some actual progression to the Michael Scott Paper Company, something that I think is used incorrectly in the series. Captain Midnight did a great video talking about what a missed opportunity this was. I'll link that video down in the description. Check it out and tell him I sent you along or something. I like a lot of this episode, but I'm also not a big fan of other parts. 
Dwight going behind Charles' back to help Michael and then turning on him was pretty funny, especially when he doesn't realize right away that Dwight betrayed him. The episode really climaxes when Michael steals Dwight's largest client from him while making him listen to it on the phone. I'm not a big fan of the prank that Jim plays on Andy, which is more similar to emotional manipulation than it is to a prank. Because of the duality and plot lines in this episode, I think it's more of a middling episode. It could be much better if the B-plot with Jim and Andy was just a smidge better. With this episode, Michael's revenge on Dunder Mifflin is complete. We find out that the Michael Scott Paper Company doesn't have much time left. They're running through what's left of their money pretty rapidly and running out of options. Luckily, after losing so many clients to the Michael Scott Paper Company, David Wallace decides the best option is to simply buy out the company. So the episode turns into a battle of the minds between the Michael Scott Paper Company and Dunder Mifflin. Somehow, Michael convinces David to simply hire him back to his original position as branch manager and both Pam and Ryan in sales. I really like this episode. It manages to reset the status quo in a pretty satisfying way. Seeing Charles finally realize what Dwight is actually like throughout the episode is also pretty hilarious. This is a good episode, I'd say towards the top of the season. This episode has a lot to love. For starters, this is one of my favorite cold opens. This episode is the result of the previous episodes and Michael, Pam, and Ryan all stealing the Dunder Mifflin employees' clients. This is the logical conclusion for all of the salespeople and I'm happy that they did think to go this route. Michael ultimately decides to give back the clients that were stolen to the employees who originally made the sale. But this leaves Michael in a rough position. He can't keep both Pam and Ryan on in sales. He decides to keep Pam on, placing Ryan back in his temp position. In the B-plot, it's casual Friday and Meredith is wearing a, we'll call it, revealing dress. There's a lot of discourse over what to do, but Toby ends up just canceling casual Friday. This is a pretty funny episode, honestly. It's a good follow-up to the entirety of the Michael Scott Paper Company arc and a pretty good episode throughout. This is just a fun episode. There's not a huge plot or anything, but once this episode really gets moving, it's just fun to see all the characters having, well, fun. After a couple of heavier episodes, it's nice to just see everyone kick back and dance. There's a lot to like about this episode, and it's just funny throughout. It's pretty simple, so there's not a ton to say, but that doesn't mean it isn't a really good episode. It is. Unlike many of the previous season finales, all the threads throughout the season have largely been wrapped up. This allows this episode to just kind of exist without needing to put a nice bow on everything, but it still ends up doing that pretty nicely. Michael has a bit of a reunion with Holly, who is dating someone else. The two put on a skit where they end up accidentally revealing that the Buffalo branch will be shutting down. This sets up the rest of the company to kind of rally around the Scranton branch as they take on corporate in a volleyball game. Pam ends up twisting her ankle and Charles insists Jim take her to the hospital because he doesn't want to lose. Charles is a really crappy person, honestly. Anyways, at the hospital, it's hinted at that Pam is actually pregnant. This is a pretty funny episode and another really fun one. Definitely one of the better episodes this season. This season felt like it started off incredibly slow. It's definitely not as good as the previous season, but many of the episodes still hold up very well. There are some episodes that feel like they can stand up against the very best episodes of the entire series, but many episodes either just drag or are kind of there. There's a lot of setup for the Michael Scott Paper Company, which only ends up lasting a few episodes and is, in all honesty, a bit of a big missed opportunity in the series. The season feels like a step down from the previous one. It's not bad by any stretch of the imagination. It has many of the best cold openings in the show, but it's far from being as good as season four or season three. On to season six. After Michael finds out and accidentally spreads around the office that Stanley is having an affair, Michael decides to spread rumors about everyone in the office, including that Pam is pregnant, something that no one in the office knows yet. This episode is a great way to kick off the season. There are a lot of funny parts like Michael accidentally revealing that Stanley's cheating to his wife at the end of the episode, and some great creed lines. If I can't scuba, then what's this all been about? What am I working toward? 
which is a great thing. Solid episode all around. This episode isn't nearly as good as the first. It mainly serves to set up a new dynamic in the office with Jim and Michael being announced as co-managers. It's pretty funny seeing Michael sabotaging Jim, not realizing that if Jim were to get his job, that Michael would actually get a promotion. This episode isn't overly funny. In fact, it's more on the serious end of things, which is really weird for a show like The Office. Not my favorite episode. This episode has a lot, and I mean a lot, of tension. Jim and Michael are struggling to find a good compromise and division of work as co-managers, and David Wallace tasks them with telling the office that not everyone will be getting their desired raises this year. Obviously, everyone is upset with all of Jim's efforts, despite him doing his best. What's interesting in this episode is that we actually get to see the experience that Michael Scott actually has as manager for the first time. Despite his apparent ineptitude, Michael does know the office. He knows how people will react to different things, and for the most part, he knows how to keep peace as best he can. He's really come a long way from the first season of the show, and I always look at this as the first time he really shows that. The episode ends with Jim and Michael bonding in Jim's office, drinking some gin, as the office workers try to get answers as to who is and who isn't getting a raise. Despite some praise I gave, this isn't the strongest episode. There's not a lot that's funny, but it shows the slow dynamic change between Michael and Jim, which is important for the future. This two-parter feels like it's been built up to for basically the entire series. And that's because it has. Finally, we're getting into Jim and Pam's wedding. As you'd expect from such a monumental episode, it's handled very well. The second half of this two-parter is much stronger than the first, I think, with the first part being more focused around getting everyone to Niagara and trying to keep Pam's pregnancy secret from her Nana, and the second part being focused more around the actual wedding. There is an absolute ton of funny moments in both parts. Andy tearing a scrotum dancing, Jim being the one to spill the beans on the pregnancy instead of Michael, Michael not having a hotel room, Dwight doing the horizontal hula with one of Pam's bridesmaids, and Michael eventually hooking up with Pam's mother. These episodes are great and have some nice sentimental moments littered throughout, as you'd expect. Definitely the best episodes of the season so far. This is another really funny episode. Michael is convinced by Dwight and Andy that the insurance agent he talked to is actually part of the mafia. The entirety of the scene of Dwight, Andy, and Michael at the restaurant is hilarious. And for you, sir? I will have the gabagool. What? The gabagool. I, I don't really know what that is. Not to mention Andy showing up dressed as a mechanic with a tire iron in case things get heated. The whole situation is funny and feels like classic office shenanigans. This is also the only episode in the entire series without Jim and Pam in it, though they are heard through the phone. That kind of brings the episode down a bit for me, but Kevin pretending to be Jim and canceling Jim's credit card is pretty funny, which definitely helps. This is a great, classic episode. This episode brings back Jim and Pam from their honeymoon and gives us a pretty big revelation. Michael has begun dating Pam's mother. Jim finds out but begs Michael to not tell Pam, knowing that she, and probably anyone else in that situation, wouldn't take the news too well. Pam, of course, finds out and reacts as you'd expect. Overall, this episode isn't overly funny and doesn't introduce us to much outside of a new dynamic going forward, at least for a few episodes. A pretty boring episode overall, but at least we see Michael being kind of nice to Toby for a hot minute, so I guess that's something? Next episode. This episode had great potential, but in my opinion doesn't capitalize on it nearly as much as it could have. There's a lot of funny moments, but the overarching plot and the reveal at the end are both on the weaker end, at least in my opinion. Michael forces his way into going with Jim on a sales call. Michael has apparently fallen into the koi pond in the lobby. It's hilarious to think about and even funnier to see. Aaron popping in later and slowly announcing that a fish has died is always hilarious to me. But they end up taking it in a weird direction, with Jim actually having let Michael fall into the koi pond because he was frustrated with him. The B plot of Pam and Andy going out to try and make business sales is also kind of weak and awkward, but not in a funny way. Kind of a mid-tier episode. 
This episode holds a very strange place in my heart. I really enjoy it and the idea of it, but it kind of hurts to watch. The episode revolves around Jim and Pam going on a double date with Michael and Pam's mother. But what makes this episode work for me is the turns from both Pam and Michael. After seeing how well Michael actually treats her mother and how happy he makes her, Pam changes her mind about Michael and her mother dating and begins to actually approve of their relationship. While Michael, after realizing just how much older Pam's mother is, begins to seriously reconsider the relationship, ultimately deciding to break up with her. At the dinner, with Pam and Jim. On her birthday. It's hilariously awkward, but I kind of really dig it. I'll probably rank this episode a lot higher than most people. This brings back the whole Dunder Mifflin might be going bankrupt storyline that we haven't heard much of in a while. But what makes this episode work so well in my opinion is that even with that kind of being the main focus, Michael decides to distract everyone with a game of murder. I've already said it in this video, but I really enjoy episodes that give everyone a chance to shine. Seeing Michael stand up to Jim and actually making a solid point while showing just how competent he can be as a manager is fun to see. Solid episode overall. This episode has one of my favorite cold openings, Recyclops. Seeing the years pass and Recyclops evolve, or devolve, I guess, is hilarious. But unfortunately, the rest of the episode doesn't really live up to the opening. It's a pretty boring episode overall, with both the A plot and B plots being largely forgettable. Honestly, I just kind of forget that this episode exists a lot of the time. Pretty low tier episode. <sighs> well, here we are. We had to get to this episode eventually. If you've ever watched some of the cringier episodes of The Office and thought, what if they really dialed this up to 10, then this is exactly what you're looking for. It's hard to watch because of just how purely uncomfortable it makes you. Which is sad because it's a relatively funny episode. Seeing Michael be forced to face his lies from the past is a pretty funny premise. And while that's going on, Dwight pulls off some crazy 4D level chess to get everyone in the office to turn against Jim in an effort to get him fired from the co-manager position. That's another pretty cringy plot and the whole thing really hurts to watch, but in a kind of good way, I guess? While this episode is probably one of the most well-known episodes of the series, I don't think it stands out as fantastic. Probably more mid-tier. Another fantastic Christmas episode. This one mainly revolves around Michael being jealous of Phyllis, who has actually been allowed to be Santa in the office. Michael ends up throwing a tantrum, which is honestly hilarious, and ends up dressing as Jesus. This episode also reveals that Dunder Mifflin is, in fact, being bought by another company, and that all the higher-ups, like David Wallace, will be losing their jobs, but the branches will all be safe. Also, Andy buying Aaron the entire 12 days of Christmas and it being an absolutely horrible gift is hilarious. This serves as a pretty solid setup for the next arc of the show, but it sets it up in a way that serves the current plot and isn't boring like some of the previous setup episodes have been. Fantastic episode from start to end. After being told that the office is being bought, a banker comes to Scranton to determine the branch's worth. This ends up taking place in a clip show episode, which I don't really like. It's nice seeing clips from past episodes, but I don't really like clip show episodes, so I'll be ranking this one pretty low. This episode has a lot going on. New characters, a new company, and new dynamics. But unfortunately, this episode really can't stand up with all of this weight on it. And the result is one of the most boring episodes of The Office. There's nothing really to write about that happens in this episode, it's just kind of dull. Which honestly might make this two of the roughest episodes back to back. So after spending a solid portion of this season building up the new working relationship between Michael and Jim as co-managers, this episode completely undoes that and moves Jim back down into a sales position. That's really about it. This probably didn't need to be an entire episode. You can really tell that the season has hit a bit of a rut at this point. This is the point where there's just not a lot to say about some of these episodes. There isn't a lot happening, there aren't a ton of jokes that really stand out, it's just overall another pretty weak episode. This is another two-parter and these are the episodes that finally have Pam giving birth. As great as Niagara was earlier this season, this pair of episodes aren't really as strong as that. 
which to be fair is a high bar. There are some funny moments with Pam trying to avoid going to the hospital and Michael being traumatized by the miracle of childbirth after walking in to help Pam. This is also the first time we hear of the Scranton Strangler, which is always fun. But this episode just isn't that strong, unfortunately. This episode feels like a definite return to form, especially after the last several episodes, which have been largely pretty boring. Michael's interactions with Joe are pretty hilarious, and it's funny to see someone who's not really used to dealing with Michael be forced to. And ultimately, this does end up with Michael sort of standing up to Joe, which is always nice to see. My favorite Michael moments tend to be those where he's standing up for his employees. The Dwight and Jim subplot where Dwight is actively trying to get Jim to go back home so he can get Megadesk back again is funny as well, and made even more funny by the fact that it actually works. This is a very solid episode and one of my favorites from the season so far. This is another episode that kind of lands in that weird place for me. I don't normally like the episodes where there's a ton of fighting in the office, but this episode does it better than most of the others I can think of. There are a lot of parts of this episode that I think work really well. There's a fight between Dwight and Michael that has a pretty wholesome resolution. The smile that washes over Stanley's face always makes me laugh. And of course, there's the first kiss between Aaron and Andy. There's a lot to like about this episode, but I still have a hard time getting around the fighting between everyone in the office. I think it's more of a mid-tier episode for this reason. There's just about everything I love in this episode. A solid Stanley segment, check. Dwight being weirdly good with women, check. This episode is absolutely fantastic, but it absolutely goes beyond and gives us an all-time classic, Date Mike. Hi, I'm Date Mike. Nice to meet me. How do you like your eggs in the morning? Seeing Michael absolutely tank a date that he was doing relatively well on after he realizes that it was actually a date is funny and probably the most Michael Scott thing we've seen in a while. Every part of this episode works and works well, and it features the vast majority of the characters in creative ways. The only thing I'm kind of sad about is that we don't see Isabel after. I feel like her and Dwight made a fantastic couple and it could have opened some great plot lines with Jim and Pam as well. But even with that, it's a fantastic episode. As much as I love Aaron as a character, this episode doesn't really do her any favors. This episode always felt like kind of a drag for me for that reason. Seeing Aaron literally break down because Andy was engaged to someone else is weird to me. I can understand being upset that something like that wasn't brought up, but this actually ends their relationship, which feels kind of weird. The other plotline, which revolves around making fun of Kevin and eventually Gabe, isn't my favorite either. Overall, I think this is kind of a weak episode, but I can understand why some people might rank it higher than I am. This is the return of Donna, whose number Michael got at the end of the episode, Happy Hour. Seeing Michael attempt to flirt throughout the episode is pretty funny. But I don't really have a ton else to say about this episode. I honestly forget about it a lot of the time. It's not good or bad enough to be super memorable, so I'll just throw this episode towards the middle of the pack. This is another episode that I think just works from start to finish. Michael is concerned that Donna is cheating on him and tasks Dwight with following her and figuring it out. Seeing Dwight at the gym working out is hilarious, as is when he tries to seduce Donna to prove that she's cheating on him. The twist of the episode being that Donna wasn't cheating on Michael, Donna was cheating with Michael. She's actually already married. While the Daryl and Andy subplot about the printers catching fire isn't the funniest part of the episode, it does a very good job of setting up future plot lines without dragging the episode down. A solid episode overall. This is the culmination of the Michael and Donna plot line. After finding out that Donna was married in the previous episode, Michael needs to decide what to do about their relationship. None of the various plot lines in this episode ever really managed to keep me overly interested. The Dwight and Angela contract thing is kind of funny, but it's far from the funniest episode in the season. Not the strongest. Aside from season one, this is probably one of the most underwhelming season finales so far. There aren't a ton of plot lines left to wrap up the season, so it, for the most part, just feels like another episode. Yes, it's the follow-up to The Printer's Catching Fire, but I honestly don't think that was a strong enough plot thread to base the season finale off of. But this does set up some stuff for the next season. 
like Dwight buying the office building Dunder Mifflin is in, and the possibility of Holly coming back to Scranton. It's not the best episode in the series, but it gives us one of the most relatable lines. Well, I'm going through a little bit of a rough patch. Mama Jo knew there was some up. Whole year, actually. This season is a definitive step down from the previous. There are still some very solid episodes, but overall you can feel the quality of the episodes begin to dip. While seasons 3, 4, and 5 did have their own episodes that were definitely on the weaker end, the episodes were a lot more hits than misses. But this season feels like where you can kind of see the switch beginning to happen. Yes, there are still great episodes, but you can see the quality begin to slowly drop. And on that super bright note, let's pop ahead to season 7. I always see a lot of people say that this opening is one of the best, but honestly, I don't see it. I don't think it's bad or anything, but it just never really stuck out to me as exceptionally good or anything. I don't get it. But even aside from that, I never really liked this episode. Luke, Michael's nephew, wasn't a strong enough character to help carry this episode as an antagonist. That's nothing against Evan Peters, who is a very strong actor, obviously, but I think it's hard to have a character show up and be incredibly unlikable. A very forgettable episode with a cold open that a lot of people like, again, I don't get it. Overall, a weak start to the season. I think this is another pretty weak episode, but there are parts of it I like more than the previous episode, which this episode is building directly off of. Michael has to attend some counseling with Toby after seeing the results of the previous episode. I like seeing Toby actually getting Michael to open up for a bit and seeing the more vulnerable side of Michael. I also really like the side plot of Pam kind of taking advantage of the acquisition of Dunder Mifflin and using it as a chance to get herself a promotion and out of sales. This episode is by no means fantastic, but I like it more than the previous. This is a fantastic change of pace from the previous few episodes. I always found this one as pretty memorable and funny, but after the previous episodes, it's a breath of fresh air. Seeing Michael not realize that he didn't get a part in a play is hilarious and sad at the same time. It's also nice to see the entire office come together to actually support one of their own, especially after no one showed up to Pam's Archeo many seasons earlier. There's a lot to like about this episode, and I think that it just kind of works. Very good episode. I liked this episode more than I actually thought I would on this rewatch. Michael is forced to confront his past mistakes and relationships by calling all of them and telling him that he has herpes. On his face. Like a cold sore. It's interesting seeing just how much Michael has grown when he's actually talking to all of his exes. And his voicemail to Holly is very wholesome and sets things up nicely for her return in a few episodes. There's also some great scenes with Andy leading a sexual education meeting. They're pretty fantastic as well. This is a solid episode. This is another fun episode. After Michael, Jim, and Dwight all lose to another salesman, Danny Cordroy, the trio decides to set up a sting to see just how Danny is actually selling paper this successfully. So, of course, they decide to bring Meredith into the sting as a fake boss, and things go awry from there. After failing miserably at finding out Danny's secrets, Michael ends up hiring Danny on as a traveling salesman, the same position as Todd Packer. There's a subplot where Andy begins jamming with Kevin and Daryl, which is pretty wholesome and fun. Another good episode. This is yet another episode that I think kind of sits in a weird place. The whole Jim, Pam, and Danny subplot is maybe one of my least favorites of the series so far. Like, I don't get why Jim cares so much. Maybe it's funny and I just don't get it. If that's the case, please let me know down in the comments. But I do enjoy seeing everyone competing over a coupon book including Angela going very out of character in a funny and convincing way. I'm also not the biggest fan of the Michael and Daryl plotline, but I do kind of like it at the end. The Andy and Daryl interaction is pretty nice, mid-tier episode. This is maybe the first episode that I think I dislike. I've given some episodes a solid amount of critique, but I've generally found something to enjoy in just about every episode so far. This episode is kind of like a desert in that regard. I can think of maybe one part of this episode that makes me laugh, and that's just Toby pleading with God. I just have trouble finding anything to really talk about with this episode. Like, did Jim genuinely believe that Angela was stealing his child? 
Is he really that bad of a father that he lost his child after leaving her with a very elderly and confused great-grandmother? It's just a weird episode and I don't really think it works. This is a very Gabe-heavy episode, someone we really haven't talked about a ton yet. He's had some prominent roles in other episodes, but this always kind of felt like his first major episode, in my opinion. We aren't just having Gabe be the center of the episode, but we're going into his home, something that's only happened with a select few characters throughout the show's run. Seeing Michael and Gabe kind of go at each other is pretty funny, and the soundscape scene is one of my favorites. But seeing Michael turn away from his more immature side after seeing that Aaron sees him as kind of a father figure is actually quite moving. This isn't the best episode in the series, or even the season, but I like it a good bit. Much like the fictional website and company that this episode is based on, Woof.com is a very fun concept, but it doesn't really live up to its core ideas. The episode revolves around Ryan's latest business venture and his investors, several workers in the office. But how bad he actually is at running a business comes to the forefront again. It's actually kind of boring as is the gym subplot where he finds out that he doesn't have to do work because of his sales cap. I kind of like the Dwight storyline where he sets up a hay festival and names himself the Hay King. This episode also introduces us to the state senator Robert Lipton, who Angela becomes interested in. Also we meet his son, who is sure to become a very important character in the future. Michael is typically shown as, well, not the most intelligent character in the show. So when he gets the best of Oscar in a debate on China, the whole office takes the chance to make fun of Oscar. It's funny seeing Michael considered knowledgeable about something and the episode as a whole is pretty lighthearted. There's also a subplot where Pam tries to get Dwight, who has bought the building Dunder Mifflin is located in, to perform some basic repairs for the building. Upon learning that Pam was trying to trick him with a fake building, Dwight manages to get Pam to think that she got the best of him. It's a really nice ending, honestly. I like this episode. It's time for the annual Christmas episode, and we're blessed with not just a phenomenal two-parter, but also the return of Holly, because Toby is on jury duty for the Scranton Strangler case. This episode does a good job of setting up the future of Michael and Holly and shows just how much Michael has actually grown since the two originally dated. Yes, he is initially very immature, destroying the Woody doll that Holly's boyfriend had given to her, but he realizes his mistake and cleans it up realizing that he'd rather have Holly be happy. I also like The Office coming together to help Daryl make his daughter's Christmas super fun. It's really nice. And Dwight actually gets the best of Jim for once. I love this episode. It feels like it hits all the right notes consistently throughout. I always liked this episode. It has so many good plot lines and scenes that I can't help but laugh through the entirety of it. Kevin's reaction to misunderstanding Holly not being engaged. <laughs> Hey, right back at you, bitch. Michael's reaction to the same thing. <laughs> Dwight going out to meet women with Andy and Daryl and sneaking off to a strip club. And possibly one of my favorite Creed moments. I did it. I did a cartwheel. F you, f you. There's a lot going on in this episode and it never really fails to make me laugh. Fantastic episode. This is an episode that I was never the biggest fan of. I'm happy that at the end of it, Andy does get a win, something that we haven't seen a lot of in this series, but I think that Jim acts super out of character in this episode. Like he's hiding from someone that he went to elementary school with because he's embarrassed about what he said. I don't know, it just seems weird. We do see Michael and Holly getting close again, which is always nice and welcome, but even still, not a super strong episode. I liked the idea of this episode more than the actual episode itself. While we know that Michael and Holly are obviously meant to be together, Holly hasn't realized that herself quite yet. And that's basically the point of this episode. Dwight ends up using Holly like a bloodhound after Michael gets lost. I like the interactions of Pam and Dwight on the phone. Okay, I just, when you're done or anytime it's convenient, I just thought since you're out. Pam, I'm obviously gonna get that stuff for you, so just shut up. And it's funny seeing all the different photos of Creed in disguise that got banned at the Chinese restaurant. The subplot of everyone ganging up on Gabe isn't my favorite either, and this just adds up to not being the strongest episode in the series. On the bright side of this episode, Michael and Holly are officially dating again. 
But that's really the only positive I can think of in this episode. This is one of my least favorite episodes so far, something that I've said a few times, and I'm sure I'll say at least a few more times throughout the rest of this video, as the quality continues to ultimately dip. But for now, this is definitely up there. The Jim and Pam going for Valentine's Day lunch and getting drunk plotline isn't all that funny. It mostly just feels kind of like a missed opportunity. Just another meh episode. I love this episode, but it feels so drastically different from every other episode of The Office. And I think that really works to the benefit of an already solid premise. The episode also gives us a fantastic way to look back at how characters used to be and how they've developed through the series. Seeing past relationships such as Jan and Pam's mother, or characters that aren't in the series anymore, like Karen. But my favorite part is when Michael actually takes a step back and looks at his past self and realizes how juvenile a lot of his past actions and desires were. And he has Holly to thank for this. This is, in my opinion, the most development we've seen for a character in such a short amount of time. Not to mention, the movie itself is hilarious. They put the whole thing on YouTube a while back. I'd highly suggest watching it at some point. A classic episode and one of my favorites so far. Continuing the trend of Michael's rapid character development, Michael must now face down his greatest threat yet, his best friend Todd Packer. Todd is a direct parallel for who Michael used to be, and Holly is who he's rapidly becoming. So this episode really boils down to if Michael wants to confront his past and change, or if he wants to stay stagnant. While I think the idea behind this episode and everything it's meant to represent is great, I think the episode itself kind of falls flat. Todd Packer, in my opinion, functioned more as a small doses character. So seeing him for a long period of time like this isn't my favorite. The episode isn't overly funny, and while I like Michael finally standing up to Todd Packer, I think this episode ends more towards the lower middle end of the pack. This is a very important episode in the series, and thankfully it's handled incredibly well. Michael has decided it's time to propose to Holly, by pouring gasoline in the shape of the letters and lighting them on fire. A very Michael Scott way to do it. But with the help of everyone, Michael does manage to put together a super heartwarming romantic proposal that Holly accepts. And then the two of them reveal that they're leaving. We're moving to Colorado. All of us? Yep. The Dwight subplot where he tries trading up and gets tricked by Jim's magic legumes is hilarious, as is the subplot where Kevin tricks Daryl and Andy and takes their money. This is a very strong episode all around. And that is Dallas. I don't know if this is a controversial opinion, but I never really liked D'Angelo as a character. He always felt really out of place to me, which maybe was the point, to show how hard it would actually be to replace Michael. It always felt to me like they kind of spent a lot of time building him up to just get rid of him super quickly. It was kind of jarring. But anyways, D'Angelo, played by Will Ferrell, is set to be Michael's replacement, and this is his introduction. There's some funny parts, Andy basically hurting himself to get D'Angelo to laugh, and Kevin's toupee always stuck out to me, but I never really liked this episode too much, mid-tier at best. This is a fun episode filled with its fair share of cringy moments that I think work pretty well in trying to set what will eventually become the new normal. While Michael is excited to host his final Dundies, D'Angelo is not. They're really working to set up that D'Angelo and Michael are not the same character. They're really not even that similar. This episode is very good with a lot of funny moments. I love Dwight being super passive aggressive the entire time but still working his keyboard, Aaron breaking up with Gabe incredibly publicly as she's accepting her Dundee, and Gabe then taking the mic and being, well, Gabe hurts to watch in the best way. And then the episode takes a turn when everyone returns to the office and does a super nice song for Michael that really makes it sink in that, yes, he's leaving. And soon. A very strong episode. Here it is, Michael's last episode. They knew they really needed to hit this one out of the park, and they did. This episode is constantly towing the line between heartwarming and funny. No one knows that it's actually Michael's last day, thinking he'll be back for his final day tomorrow. 
but Michael spends the whole episode going around and saying goodbye to all of the characters that we've come to know throughout the series. There's some really memorable, tear-jerking moments, like Dwight reading Michael's letter of recommendation and then the two of them finally getting to play paintball together. But there's also the scene where Michael gives Kevin a character of Kevin as a pig and rips it up, telling him not to be a caricature. The dichotomy of these two play off each other really well. When eventually Jim figures everything out and instead of saying goodbye to Michael, which neither of them really want, just gives this incredibly beautiful speech. But one person isn't at the office. Pam went to the movies and can't be reached. The eventual scene of Pam running through the airport and hugging Michael and the two saying goodbye is such a beautiful scene. This episode is really elite and hits you like a ton of bricks if you're not ready for it. This is the first episode of Life Without Michael, and again, I really don't like his replacement D'Angelo. And this episode really highlights all of the reasons why. He's incredibly vindictive, seemingly a compulsive liar, and just all around pretty sexist. There are a few funny parts in this episode, but I'm not really a big fan of it as a whole. But just as quickly as they introduced him, D'Angelo suffers brain damage after dunking a basketball and is never seen in the series again. The bait and switch in this character is kind of rough. Not my favorite. The one really good thing I can say about D'Angelo as a manager is that because of his sudden departure, we get to see Dwight as acting manager. And it doesn't take him long to really mess things up, accidentally firing off a gun in the office, causing Andy to temporarily lose his hearing. I love Andy referring to himself as a gunshot victim as well, it's hilarious. This is the first episode that feels like it's finding a sense of normalcy after the departure of Michael. It's a pretty funny episode that ends with Creed being named acting manager, because again, Dwight messed up real bad. This is the two-part finale, and I think it's a fun episode. We don't know who the next manager of the Scranton branch will be, and seeing all the cameos of people coming in to interview is a really fun concept. We get to see Jim Carrey, Will Arnett, Ray Romano, and Ricky Gervais all interviewing for this position, as well as a few internal candidates. Alternatively, we get to see a small glimpse into life under the rule of Creed, which is absolutely hilarious. I like this episode, and I think it does a pretty good job of making you want to check back in next season to see who the next manager will actually be. And we also get one of my favorite Gabe quotes. Shut up about the sun! Shut up about the sun! This season is definitely the turning point. Michael Scott was always the most popular character in the series, and now he's gone. That's a huge power vacuum and a hard position to fill. They don't do terribly after he leaves, but one of these episodes is all about trying to find a replacement for Michael, so it's kind of hard to judge. There were a lot of episodes in the season that I think were the weakest of the series. It's a very hit or miss kind of season. Either an episode is fantastic or it's completely forgettable. In most of the previous seasons, even if an episode was weak, it was still typically a pretty good episode. But this is the first season where there's episodes that I just straight up don't like. And I know it's going to get harder from here. And I know it's going to get harder from here on out. On to season 8. So a lot has happened off screen between seasons. Robert California was selected as the manager for Scranton, decided he'd rather be CEO, and convinced Joe to retire and got her job. He then named Andy as replacement manager. I always felt like Robert California was a weird addition to the show. His dynamic with Andy as manager works well sometimes, but just doesn't others. This episode does a pretty good job of introducing Robert California and where he fits in though. And I do like Andy standing up to Robert at the end of the episode and listing off everyone's positive traits. It's a nice scene. But on a personal note, as someone from Pennsylvania, I don't understand why someone would go out of their way to live there. Not a bad start to the series, we've certainly had worse. Robert gives Andy what is essentially an impossible task, to double their sales. Andy decides to start an incentive program to get the employees to work harder. This backfires when Andy sets what he thinks is an impossible goal and promises to get a tattoo if they reach the goal. Everyone comes together and works harder than they've ever worked in the entirety of the series. They reach the goal and Andy gets a tattoo and more respect from his former co-workers, now employees. It's a funny episode that I think works pretty well. 
I like this a lot more than the previous episode, but it's not the best I've seen from the series. This isn't the funniest episode, but I like that it explores more of the character of Daryl that we haven't seen before. The warehouse staff wins almost a million dollars in the lottery, aside from Daryl who stopped playing after his promotion earlier in the series. Daryl gets pretty depressed and tells Andy to basically fire him. Andy manages to snap Daryl out of this funk and gets him back on track. I really like this interaction actually. These characters have gotten pretty close in the last few seasons and I'm happy that they're continuing to build this friendship. The subplot revolves around several of the office workers trying to unload boxes, that's pretty funny. A good episode overall. This is another pretty meh episode. It has some good parts, but a lot of boring parts as well. There really just isn't a lot happening in this episode. Andy throws a garden party to impress Robert California and his parents, failing to do both. This episode isn't overly funny or creative, aside from a few small instances. Jim writing an entire book on garden parties to prank Dwight is borderline psychotic actually. Like, Jim, you have a full-time job, a child, and another one on the way. Where are you getting the time to write and self-publish an entire fake book? And if you're that good at time management, why aren't you doing something else? Well, I guess we'll touch on that point later in the series. In another season, this would probably be a low-tier episode, but here it's more towards the middle. Spooked is a pretty light episode for the most part. I always liked Dwight's Halloween costume and him bonding with Robert California's son over StarCraft. Robert California spends the entire episode slowly figuring out everyone's deepest fears throughout the episode and weaving them all together in a scary story at the end of the episode that deeply affects everyone. This is a great bit of characterization for him and really makes him seem like a sociopathic business monster. It's a fun episode for the most part, albeit pretty simple. I love this concept for an episode, but I think that it feels sort of half-baked. Dwight sets up a doomsday scenario where if the office makes five mistakes in a day, an automated email will be sent to Robert California that will likely result in everyone getting fired. I think it's a fun concept, but it seems like something Dwight would have done several seasons ago, not at this point. So it's weird that he would take such drastic actions. And the ending of the episode feels kind of forced, almost. Maybe that's not the right word, but it's disappointing. This is an alright episode that could have been much, much better. Pam's replacement introduces us to uh, Pam's replacement. She's preparing to go on maternity leave and Kathy, a character that will come to be hated, is being trained. Pam thinks that Jim finds her attractive and sets out to prove it. Pam and Dwight team up to prove it to pretty funny results. I really like seeing Dwight and Pam team up and the two of them becoming actual friends but I really don't like the subplot of this episode that revolves around Robert California basically taking over the band Daryl, Andy, and Kevin have formed and basically taking their jam space over. Maybe I'm just not the biggest Robert California fan. I don't really like this episode. Both plot lines fall kind of flat. Robert mistaking Kevin for a genius who's speaking in complex food metaphors isn't funny to me. Same thing for the crew at Gettysburg. It's all just pretty boring and forgettable. I can only think of one part of this episode that I actually find funny, and that's Gabe being mistaken for an Abraham Lincoln impersonator. I like that he's just kind of too timid and ends up going along with it. I haven't mentioned it yet, but I absolutely love Zach Woods, the actor who plays Gabe. If you like Gabe, I'd highly suggest watching Silicon Valley. He's absolutely hilarious and steals the show constantly but unfortunately he can't quite save this episode. Very low tier. Robert California continues to be a pretty terrible human by putting Andy in an absolutely garbage situation. His wife is going to come in and ask for a job and Andy has to turn her down. But of course, Robert tries to play both sides. I'm not a huge fan of this plot or really any of the plots so far heavily involving Robert California. I kind of like the subplot of Dwight putting in a gym and getting Daryl to sign up for it before getting him to finally admit that he's trying to impress Val. And it's funny that Dwight thinks he's talking about Val Kilmer, which is a fair guess. Pretty forgettable episode. It's time once again for the annual Christmas episode. This is one of the better episodes in the season, but definitely not one of the stronger Christmas episodes. Andy is introducing his new girlfriend to the rest of the office during the Christmas party. 
Aaron, who is upset, ends up getting absolutely plastered at the party. And Kelly, being absolutely ride or die, gets the green light to be mean to Andy's new girlfriend. <laughs> oh, Jessica, did you just fart? I think there's some funny parts in here, but I really like the interactions between Jim and Dwight, essentially bullying themselves to try and get the other person's Christmas bonus. There's some funny moments in here, and it's definitely one of the better episodes of the season so far. I absolutely love this episode. It's such a refreshing change of pace from basically everything we've seen so far this season. It's like finding an oasis after wandering through the desert. The cold open of this episode is hilarious. Kevin breaking the silence is classic. Oh yeah! Oh, I knew it! I like the plot of everyone competing in trivia to get prize money so Andy can hit the sales growth challenge that Robert California gave him. And I think it's absolutely hilarious watching the groups split up automatically. I love that everyone just kind of knows where they fit in for the most part. Seeing the Just For Fun group do surprisingly well and even winning the whole thing after Kevin is able to name a French film is just the icing on the cake. Meanwhile, Dwight has gone to Florida to confront Robert California about becoming manager somewhere. Dwight figuring out where Robert is is funny, but it's a bit rough seeing Robert tell Dwight that he's better in a sales position than in management. By far the best episode of the season so far. As much as I dislike Robert California typically, I think this episode works very well. And I think that's partly because while the story takes place at Robert California's place, he's really relegated to more of the B-plot, with the A-plot revolving more around Aaron and Andy, which I'm thankful for because I love these two together, even if they aren't yet. I like Dwight helping Aaron kind of get Andy's attention, and Dwight calling Andy out for not realizing what he and Aaron had. It's surprisingly apt for Dwight. And I really feel for Jim trying to sneak away from the party, I've done that a couple times, a surprisingly good episode. I'm not a fan of this one, Jim decides to just not show up for work for a week, and he tells Andy and everyone at the office a big fat lie that he had jury duty, and almost immediately gets caught for lying. I think this is on the weaker end as far as stories go. Jim doesn't like work, but I can't see him just not showing up for a week and not calling in or something. And at the end when everyone just kind of let it go, including Dwight who was going out of his way to try to get Jim fired. Not the best episode, but this is the start of the Dwight maybe being the father of Angela's newborn child plotline. Mid-tier episode. This is the beginning of my least favorite arc in the entirety of the series. Or at least the setup for it. This is a pretty boring episode, honestly. The only part of this episode that I can say I really like is Stanley trying to go to Florida. So the episode revolves around Dwight selecting a crew to take to Florida for a special project. Andy says no to his crew and gives him a new one. That's really it, not a ton to talk about, low tier. So this really kicks off the Florida arc in the show. This introduces us to Nelly, a character that I know people really don't like. I'm kind of in the same boat myself. I don't know if it's actually her character or the decisions that are made for her, but she's unpopular either way. This also brings back Todd Packer who becomes a regular for the rest of the arc. Remember earlier how I said Todd Packer is a small doses character? Making him into a series regular for a few episodes really proves that to me. I don't really like this episode, but seeing Florida Stanley in all of his glory is pretty fantastic. Of all of the episodes in the Florida arc, I think this is probably the best one. And by best, I mean I get some kind of enjoyment out of it. There are a lot of moving parts in this episode. Kathy is trying to seduce Jim, but Dwight eventually helps get rid of Kathy. Dwight manages to mostly seduce Nellie before giving her a messed up key to his room. Aaron tells Ryan that she's thinking of staying in Florida and Ryan thinks that Aaron is trying to hook up with him. And Val's boyfriend thinks that Daryl and Val are hooking up. There's just too much going on in this episode, I think. If they got rid of one or two of these plot lines and let some of the others shine, then I think it would be stronger. It's probably the best of the Florida Arc episodes, but it's still not great. This is the result of the Florida crew's hard work, the launch of the Sabre store. It's obviously supposed to be similar to an Apple store, and Dwight, who's in charge, has given everyone their rules, which basically everyone fails at. Jim ends up giving Ryan speech and clothes that are obviously not his size, which is kind of funny, but this is just another forgettable episode in my least favorite arc. For people who are watching week to week at this time, 
it was kind of talked about if Dwight was actually going to stay in Florida and leave the show. Or at least I talked about it with some people that I knew. It comes out in this episode that Robert California is planning on sandbagging the whole Saber Store idea and firing whomever is in charge of the project, which right now happens to be Dwight. I do like the dynamic between Jim and Dwight this episode, with Jim really going out of his way to help Dwight even though Dwight doesn't really want any help. And I'm happy that we finally get back to Scranton. Aside from Aaron, who has decided to stay in Florida. But at the end of the episode, Andy goes back to Florida to get her back. Not a great episode, but at least we're through the worst parts of the Florida arc with just a bit of cleanup left to go. This is said cleanup and the setup for the next bit of the season. And I really don't like what's to come. With Andy out of the office going to Florida to get Aaron back, Nellie shows up, sits in office, and decides that she is the manager now. And slowly, she gets just about everyone behind her by offering them more money, which, as Jim points out, she can't do because she's not actually the manager. Andy, like I said, is down in Florida trying to get Aaron back, which he ultimately succeeds at. We're kind of setting up the new status quo in this episode, but I really don't think it works. I don't like Nellie too much and her just showing up all of a sudden and saying, no, I'm in charge now, is kind of weird. Maybe the worst episode of the bunch so far. Well, I spoke too soon. I can't think of a single positive thing with this episode. The Andy breaking up with his current girlfriend Jessica so he and Aaron can date plotline doesn't really work for me. The other plotline is very Nelly centric and she's just the worst as well. They kind of try to drum up some sympathy for her with some kind of ex-boyfriend backstory, but I think it falls flat. This is my least favorite episode of the entire series so far. Man, this is a really rough stretch of episodes. Andy and Nellie finally meet each other after she showed up while he was out of town and just kind of assumed his job. Andy calls Robert California, who ends up just giving the position to Nellie. Eventually after, he punches the wall again. This episode just kind of hurts my brain to watch. Like, nothing in it really makes sense for the story as a whole. Another pretty meh episode. This episode shows us the continued downfall of Andy's character after he's been kind of ousted from Dunder Mifflin Scranton. We see Andy at a fundraiser trying to pretend like he's doing alright, but it's obvious he isn't. Andy, of course, ends up adopting 12 dogs at the fundraiser to show just how mentally well he's actually doing. There's at least some funny moments in this episode, like the reveal of Kevin's dog being actually alive despite how he described her, and Dwight misunderstanding how a silent auction works. It's better than most of the last few episodes, but still not fantastic. This episode is a good change of pace from the last, what, half of the season? It's actually pretty good. It has some very solid bits, like Lloyd Gross, who Pam drew as a combination of everyone in sales and the Syracuse employee who has one of my weirdly favorite lines from the season. You live well down here in PA. It once again tries to drum up sympathy for Nelly, but I don't really think it does it that well. But what I do really like about this episode is that Andy swoops in, steals the client that everyone was trying to get, and goes to David Wallace with an idea to buy Dunder Mifflin. It's nice to see Andy getting himself back on track and actually making a sale as well. It's not the best episode in the series, but one of the better ones in this season. This episode sets up Andy to finally get back at Nelly in Robert, California, something that basically everyone who has watched the show has wanted. Andy shows up, gets hired as a janitor, and everyone thinks he's just a drunk who has reached rock bottom. But as we know, Andy has secretly got David Wallace to buy back Dunder Mifflin and name him as manager again. While it seems like he's ready for his revenge, he actually doesn't get any. Robert California gets to go be a creep overseas and Nellie ends up getting rehired by Andy. Kind of a letdown in my opinion. Dwight also has a big plan to figure out for sure if he's the father of Angela's child or not, and that's kind of the cliffhanger at the end of the episode. That's alright. This season was… rough to say the least. Unlike in previous seasons, there were entire parts of this one that I didn't like. This is the worst season I've watched by far. You can sort of feel them trying different things out to see what exactly they think the show will be going forward. There are moments where it seems like they're on the cusp of finding out what can work, 
But then we have the whole Florida arc thing. It's a rough season that doesn't really know what it wants to be. On to the final season. It's another good old fashioned season opener. And that of course means catching us up on everything that's happened since the end of last season. This time some characters like Ryan and Kelly are gone, but now we have new characters like Plop and Clark. Two characters who I'm really indifferent to. It's actually weird how much I don't care about them despite the fact that they're in more episodes than Holly, which is crazy to think about. Also, Jim has started a business with some friends behind Pam's back for some reason. Either way, this episode is pretty forgettable. It's not as bad as anything from last season though, so a big step up. This is another forgettable episode. It's kind of cool seeing Roy who's gotten himself together since everything with Pam and Jim. He really grew up and matured since then and it's interesting to see. But aside from that, there's really nothing major to talk about in this episode. Aaron and Pete get dinner and they start hinting at something there, but it kind of feels like Andy and Aaron just started dating, so it's a little weird. You can tell they want to do another Pam and Jim thing, but Andy is a likable character at the moment, so it really doesn't work. This episode gives us a fantastic cold open where Jim replaces himself with an Asian man to prank Dwight, but that's really the biggest positive I can think of with this episode. This is really just another setup episode with Pam finally finding out that Jim started the company without telling her. It's a forgettable episode that's still trying to remedy the whole Nellie is a terrible person thing that they spent a bulk of last season setting up. Pretty forgettable. This episode feels a lot better than most of this season so far. Jim is trying to get back on Pam's good side and he tries to get the whole office building shut down for a few days. But this leads to everyone working on a work bus. This gives us some funny moments like the singing. My name is Kevin. Yeah. That is my name. Yeah. They call me Kevin. Yeah. Cause that's my name. Roll, roll. Kevin's quick math is also pretty great. 314 pies. It's not the best of the series, but this episode definitely feels like a step up from what we've seen so far. Get your car wash today. Ba -da -ba. This is the final Halloween episode in the series and dives more into Andy's time at Cornell. At least a little bit. We finally get to see Broccoli Rob, someone that Andy has mentioned several times throughout the series. We see the two kind of face off, but it's a little disappointing honestly. Jim and Pam begin to fight a bit more after Jim begins putting more and more money into the company that he helped found. It's pretty meh, honestly, I liked Work Bus more. This episode is the beginning of the end for Andy. His father has bankrupted his family and fled. Andy needs to kind of get everything in order. This could have been an amazing character building moment for him. We could have seen him gaining the respect of his family as he helps bring them back from the brink. Instead, Andy ditches Aaron and goes sailing for a good part of the season. It makes no sense to me. But on the other side of things, I really like the prank on Dwight back at the office where they get him to think he's doing an interview on the radio and basically get him to go crazy over the air. It's hilarious. That alone brings this episode up quite a few pegs in my opinion. Andy is still gone and the office is just kind of continuing to function. At least Nelly isn't stealing his job this time I guess. The office finds out that there's a huge account opening up and Dwight is tasked with getting the sale. But the person in charge is a woman. Pam spends a bunch of time training Dwight on how to talk to women without being super condescending but when the two get there, they realize that it's actually Jan. I absolutely love that they brought her back for her first proper appearance in seasons. She's such a fun, insane character. Dwight successfully makes the sale by essentially pimping out Clark. Toby is also uncharacteristically funny in this episode. Smile if you love men's prostate. And they continue to push the Aaron and Plop relationship. I like this episode and I think it's pretty funny. This episode is incredibly over the top and I'm kind of all about it. Angela finds out that Oscar and her husband have been doing the do and ends up hiring a hitman to kill him, or at least injure him. There's a lot of funny moments with Trevor the hitman and I think that it works pretty well. Meanwhile, Jim is trying to work part time but needs Stanley and Phyllis to cover for him at Dunder Mifflin. Seeing drunk Stanley and Phyllis is hilarious and heartwarming when they tell him they'll cover for him. I like this episode. It's that time again, 
Christmas. As far as Christmas episodes go, this is probably the weakest one we've seen, but I still think it's a pretty good episode, if not a bit underwhelming. We get to see what exactly a traditional Shroot Christmas looks like, and I think it's fun. But what I really like about this episode is when Jim returns to the party, having previously left for his other job, and Dwight immediately perks up and hugs him. It shows just how far the relationship between these two has come. Daryl being drunk at the party and upset with Jim is also pretty funny and resolves itself very quickly. <laughs> Go get him! Oh! A pretty good episode. I don't have a ton to say about this episode. It's pretty boring. Meredith shaves her head, which is pretty funny, I guess. I'm also a fan of Meredith's character getting fleshed out a bit with her time with Pam at the end of the episode. The Philly stuff is pretty boring though, forgettable. I think that this episode is fun and light in a way that many episodes aren't this season. Dwight and Clark are going out to a sale as a father and son duo. I think this plotline is pretty funny and I'm happy that Clark is getting more screen time that shows he isn't just a creep. We get to see Daryl interview for a job at Jim's new company and it's pretty funny as well. I love seeing Daryl accidentally electrocute the fish with a basketball. Even the C-plot revolving around the rest of the office being hyper after drinking too much espresso is pretty funny. This episode makes me think more of earlier seasons than others. This is another one of those episodes that's kind of all over the place for me. I really like the opening with the whole the Dunder Code thing that was set up so long ago that Jim had actually forgotten the prank. And I also love the pan over after everyone gives up and a warehouse employee is just using the grill as a coffee cup. But what I really don't like is the big fight that Jim and Pam get into at the very end of the episode. I understand that couples get into fights. I understand that. But the decision for the entirety of the season to be about Pam and Jim's relationship seemingly falling apart was such a baffling choice to me. One of my least favorite episodes all around, I think. This episode really serves to show Dwight's character growth. While tasked with finding a new junior salesman, Dwight brings in an entire cast of his friends who are, well, all insane. Dwight sitting down and looking at their actual credentials as opposed to just hiring one of his friends shows how far he's come, and Clark getting the position really cements that. But the rest of the episode is pretty bland. We get more reminders that this is actually a documentary, something that I honestly think they kind of forgot about for a bunch of the middle seasons. Mid-tier at best. Remember how I said I don't like Jim and Pam fighting? Well, turns out I also don't like her almost getting hit by a random warehouse worker who decides to deface Pam's mural. I really don't like this plot, and I'm also not the biggest fan of them hinting at something between Brian, a documentary worker, and Pam. It's kind of weird in my opinion and feels sort of out of character. The rest of the plot lines are pretty boring, but we do get to see Kevin stand up for his friend. Kevin's a good friend. Pretty bland episode. Who's that girl? Who's that girl? It's Andy! Andy finally comes back after leaving several episodes earlier and tries to pick up where everything left off. And strangely enough, he almost gets away with doing just that. Sales have even gone up since Andy left on his trip. But Andy loses the White Pages account and Aaron ends up calling him out and breaks up with him while he's on speakerphone with David Wallace. So thankfully, Andy wasn't able to get away with just being a terrible boyfriend and boss for several months. But another pretty meh episode. In a continued effort of character assassination on Andy, this episode sees him take revenge on Aaron and Plop who have begun dating by hiring both of their exes, including Gabe. It's really nice seeing Gabe again. I didn't realize how much I actually missed his character until he came back and was kind of just as weird as he always was. But it's episodes like this that really make me dislike Andy, which is sad. We also see Pam interviewing for a job in Philly with someone who's pretty reminiscent of Michael Scott. And honestly, that just makes me miss him even more. Pretty mid-tier episode for the season. This episode feels weird because, well, it is. It was originally supposed to serve as a backdoor pilot for a Dwight Schrute spinoff, but obviously that never ended up happening. That's why we're introduced to a ton of new Schrutes who aren't really ever mentioned before or after this episode. I kind of like this episode even if it isn't the funniest. Dwight is obviously one of my favorite characters, and getting a whole episode where we get to see more Schrute family and customs 
concept is pretty cool. If this episode just had a few more jokes, I think it could have been one of the best of the season. This is where the series gets very meta. When promos begin to drop for the documentary that the entire show has been, The Office takes a step back and realizes just how much of their lives have actually been filmed. It's fun seeing everyone's reaction to things that might get released to the world that they may not have wanted everyone to see. Oh, what? It's a fun episode and probably one of the better episodes this season mm. at least. It's Stereo again. Come on, Stanley. I may have said this once or twice throughout the video, but I really like Stanley episodes. And this episode definitely gave us that. Dwight shoots Stanley with a bull tranquilizer. Oh, it needs to get him to a sale after the elevator in the office building has broken. I think this episode is light and funny in a way that many episodes haven't been lately. It's a pretty good episode. This is a super simple premise for an episode, but I think the workers in the office really make it work. A paper airplane competition. That's it, that's the plot. It's fun seeing everyone be uber competitive and kind of playful in a way that we really hadn't seen in a long time. But this is kind of juxtaposed with the heaviness that's still happening with Jim and Pam's relationship. I think this episode works pretty well overall and gives us some good laughs. I like seeing Aaron be super competitive and I think that it speaks a lot that Dwight knows that Angela wouldn't want his pity. A good episode. This is the episode that really feels like it's the beginning of the end. Andy decides he's going to leave to try to become a star, because of course he is. But with him gone, the unthinkable can finally happen. Dwight Schrute is manager! Dwight is finally named manager, officially. It really shows how far he's come as a character that not only is no one upset, but everyone congratulates him. It's honestly really nice and feels like a great cap on Dwight's character. But what I don't really like is how Andy decides he needs to burn all bridges so he can't change his mind and come back. Don't do David like that, he got you your life back. Easily my favorite episode of the season so far. This two-parter sets out with a super lofty goal. To wrap up as many of the storylines and character arcs as it can. Will Angela and Dwight end up together? Yes! Yes. Is Dwight actually the father of Angela's son, even though we were specifically told he wasn't? And I lied to you. I'm a dad! Will Jim and Pam get divorced? You are everything. No, they work things out. Will Andy become famous? Oh, I can't so just sit here and cry! Uh, kinda? There's a lot to like about this episode, and it feels very bittersweet, especially as the crew all gather at the bar and begin to watch the documentary that is The Office starting with the very first scene of the first episode. I like the very cyclical feel that this gives The Office, and if this was the final episode, I think it would have been good, but left a couple things unanswered. But because there's one more episode, I think that this lets this episode be its own things and helps it be fantastic. Here we are. After over 200 episodes, we're finally at the finale. And they really didn't hold anything back for this one. This episode skips ahead a year after the previous episode. We get caught up on everything that's happened in the last year that we didn't see pretty quickly. Stanley retired, Kevin and Toby were fired, Nelly quit, and Creed faked his own death. I'm not really sure why a lot of this couldn't have been happening throughout some of the slower episodes of the season, but oh well. This episode is fantastic and a great send-off for the show. We see Dwight and Angela get married with a surprise cameo from Michael Scott, who Dwight is surprised actually came. That's what she said. <laughs> the bachelor party before the wedding is also hilarious. Finally, we see the workers of the office come together one final time at Dunder Mifflin, and Jim then tries to quit, but Dwight fires him so he can get severance. And Jim and Pam plan to leave Scranton to go work for the company Jim helped found. Seeing everyone together like this and knowing that we won't see them again is really sweet, and I love this episode. Andy, of course, captures this moment perfectly. I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. Someone should write a song about that. This is the best episode of the season by far. Adding in new characters and taking others out is, unfortunately, kind of expected in a show that's gone on for this long. 
but I feel like we didn't get enough time with Clark and Plop to really flesh out their characters as well as the others. The season definitely feels not as strong as some of the previous seasons, but I also think it's better than season 8. While there are episodes that I think were boring this season, I think both the highs and lows were higher than they were in season 8. Not the worst season, and a pretty good send off to the show. Now that I have gone through every episode and gave my thoughts, I'll give what I think are the best and worst episodes of the series. Here's the list of what I think are the 5 best episodes. Hold up, before you go to yell at me for saying that Dinner Party isn't the best episode, this, again, is just my opinion. I think Stress Relief is the better episode because it features the entirety of the cast in smart and funny ways, whereas Dinner Party has a smaller cast and explores the dysfunctional relationship between Michael and Jan. I really love both episodes, but I think having the larger cast works to the benefit of Stress Relief. It probably also says something about me that two of my favorite episodes are really emotional send-offs for the show. I think that's where the show is at its best a lot of the time, when it really takes advantage of the emotional connections that viewers have created with a character or characters. Now for my bottom five. So of these episodes, I think there are really only three that I would say I dislike. The Banker is a clip show. I've seen the series so many times that it's kind of weird to see all the episodes I just binged in the last few days again. But the bottom two are episodes that I regularly skip. There's something about both of them that I just actively dislike, which is crazy for a show that I love as much as this. But what you really need to do with this list is take all of these rankings, compile them together, and shove it up your butt. 